Hi everyone and welcome to week two of Introduction to Logic. This week you're going to get an introduction to a system of logic known as propositional logic. So without further ado, let's dive in. Propositional logic is called propositional logic because the basic units of this system of logic are statements, which are also known as propositions. And if you remember in uh, our week one video, we talked about the definition of a statement. It's a bit of language that's either true or false. So for example, a simple statement might be something like today is Saturday. That's either true or it's false. That's what makes it a statement. Simple statements, which are also called atomic statements are represented by capital letters in propositional logic. So for example, capital A, capital B, capital C, capital D, and so on. And in propositional logic, multiple simple statements can be connected together by operators, which are also known as connectives or logic symbols to form compound statements. So for example, at the top of the screen here, I've got a couple of simple statements for you. Let's let the capital letter A stand for the statement, Adam West played Batman. And let's let the capital letter B stand for Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. Now, both of those statements have to happen to be true, but they're statements because they're either true or false. Those can be connected together with the English word and to form a compound statement. So at the bottom of the screen, you've got a compound statement. Adam West played Batman and Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. Now, that's, that's one English grammatical sentence but it's one compound statement. That entire statement made up of two simple statements is either true or false. And that truth value is determined by the truth values of the simple statements that make up that compound statement. But that's how compound statements work in English and in logic. Simple statements are connected together in a number of different ways that we're gonna look at momentarily using logic symbols to form compound statements. The easiest kind of these uh, uh, compound statements to understand are negations. Negations basically are the opposite of the truth value being negated. So for example, we have a capital letter L here and that let's let that stand for a sentence like this, Leonard Nimoy played Captain Kirk. Now that happens to be false, but it's still a statement. So L stands for Leonard Nimoy played Captain Kirk. Negation is represented by a tilde. This little squiggly line is called a tilde. And a tilde negates the statement that's immediately to its right. So a tilde L would be the negation of, of whatever L stands for. So it would stand for something like Leonard Demoy did not play Captain Kirk. And I think you can see that these two statements have opposite truth values. If it's false that Leonard Nimoy pl played Captain Kirk, it would be true that Leonard Nimoy did not play Captain Kirk. And the negation always has the opposite truth value of the statement that it's negating. And there are several ways of representing a negation in English, and I've included a few of them on the screen here. Tilde L, again, not L, could stand for Leonard Nimoy did not play Captain Kirk. That's the example above. It could also stand for something like, it is not the case that Leonard Nimoy played Captain Kirk. And this fairly uh, wordy phrase, it is not the case that, is a phrase in English that's used to represent an illogical negation. And we also have this, the phrase, it is false that. So the third example, it is false that Leonard Nimoy played Captain Kirk. All of these are examples of negations. They negate the statement, Leonard Nimoy played Captain Kirk. So your textbook uses the squiggly line, again called a tilde, to represent negation. Other textbooks use different symbols. You might see this little angular symbol, which is generally just called a negation symbol. And in computer programming, oftentimes you will see this uh, exclamation point to represent uh, a, a logical neg negation and Boolean logic in the computer program but your textbook uses this tilde to represent negation. I think negations are pretty easy to understand. What's interesting about negations is that they're a one place operator. The negation operator only applies to what's immediately to the right of it. Some uh, logic operators like the English word and connect two statements together where the operator goes in the middle. And we're gonna look at an example of that coming up right now. In English, we also have conjunctions. And uh, this was the example we started out by looking at a moment ago. But in conjunctions, two uh, simple statements are connected together with an and to imply that both statements are true at the same time. Uh, and there's a number of ways that th this works out in English and they all translate to the same thing in, in logic. So let's look at a couple of statements. We have the same simple statements as before. A stands for Adam West plays, played Batman. 
and B stands for Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. The dot symbol right here and down below on the screen is what's used in propositional logic to represent a conjunction or to represent an and. So A dot B would stand for Adam West played Batman and Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. One thing I want you to notice right off the bat is that I've included parentheses around the dot. And strictly speaking, every time you use one of these two place operators, you're supposed to have parentheses around the two things that are being connected. And that's important as you get more and more compound statements that have more uh, operators than just one operator and more simple statements than just two. But for now, uh, don't worry about the parentheses just yet. I'll, I'll cover this, uh, uh, how parentheses are used in, in massively compound statements here in a minute. But strictly speaking, every time you use one of these two place operators, you're supposed to have parentheses around it. That's part of the, what are called formation rules of forming compound uh, statements in, in propositional logic recursively. Um, and so I have this phrase, A dot B, and that's used to represent several different English language statements, all of which basically mean the same thing. So A dot B, A and B, could mean Adam West played Batman and Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. That's the most common translation of the dot, just directly as into an and. But there are several other English words that are used to represent a conjunction. Things like but, also, however, and moreover are also used to imply a, a, um, a conjunction in, in English. So for example, uh, A dot B could also mean Adam West played Batman, but Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. Now, what's interesting here is that the word but usually connotes some sort of contrast between the two statements that are being connected together, but it's also saying that both of those statements are true. So you could read the second sentence as saying something like this, Adam West played Batman, but it's also true that Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. Even if there's some contrast between those two statements, the, the phrase but implies that both of those two simple statements are true at the same time. Uh, in the third example here, A dot B stands for Adam West played Batman. Also, Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. So also is another kind of conjunction in English. A dot B could mean Adam West played Batman. However, Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. However is similar to but. It usually connotes some sort of contrast between the two simple statements that are being connected. But you could also read it like this. Adam West played Batman. However, it's also true that Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. And I think that shows why however is a, is a conjunction. And in the final example on the screen, A dot B could stand for Adam West played Batman. Moreover, Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. So all of those examples say it's true that Adam West played Batman and it's also true that Batman was a popular television show in the 1960s. So your textbook uses the dot symbol, that, that's the name of the symbol, it's just usually called a dot in logic, to represent a conjunction. Other textbooks use an ampersand and uh, sometimes they use this uh, caret, uh, it's called a caret. Um, if, you're, if you're in your word processor program, you might see it listed as a logical and symbol, but your textbook uses the dot to represent a conjunction. And I think you can see there, there are many, many ways we express conjunctions in English, but all of them have in common that they say the two statements that are being conjoined are both true at the same time. The next kind of logical statement I wanna look at in propositional logic is a disjunction. And a disjunction is basically an either or statement in English. So at the top of the screen, I've got a couple of simple statements. Let's let Z stand for my name is Zachary and let's let R stand for my name is Ryan. A disjunction or an or in logic is represented by a, uh, a wedge right here. That's the name of the symbol, a wedge. It looks like a lowercase v, but it's actually a separate symbol. It's usually called logical or if you're looking for, a, for it in your uh, word processing program. So Z wedge R, which means Z or R, would stand for something like this. My name is Zachary or my name is Ryan. And what that basically means is that one of the two statements is true. Either my name is Zachary or my name is Ryan. And there are several ways that we express disjunctions in English. And I think most of these are, are pretty straightforward. Um, I think this is one of the challenges about doing, doing logic in English that we have so many different ways of expressing the same basic meaning in English. It makes it really hard to translate from English into logical notation because of some of the subtleties of the language and vice versa. So we have Z wedge R that could stand for my name is Zachary or my name is Ryan. 
here just a single instance of the word or. Sometimes we use the word either in front of the first thing being disjuncted. So we have either my name is Zachary or my name is Ryan. And notice that the word either is optional. They mean the same thing. If I say my name is Zachary or my name is Ryan, that means the same exact thing as saying either my name is, is Zachary or my name is Ryan. Now your textbook also uh, tells you that you can you can represent the English word unless with a disjunction. So uh, Z wedge R could stand for my name is Zachary unless my name is Ryan. There's actually a much better way to translate unless that we'll talk about later. Um, but this is the way your textbook says to translate the English word unless into logic notation as a wedge. Um, and what's interesting here is notice that you can reverse these. So you could say, my name is Zachary, unless my name is Ryan. But you could also say, unless my name is Zachary, my name is Ryan. And both of those things say one of the two statements has to be true. Either my name is Zachary or my name is, is Ryan. So again, the simple name is a wedge that stands for an either or statement in English. Uh, other textbooks uh, occasionally will use a, what looks like a plus sign or these two vertical parallel lines, but most commonly um, in propositional logic, the uh, a logical or, or a disjunct is represented using this wedge symbol. Pretty easy to understand. Um, I should say while we're talking about either or statements that there's a difference between what's called inclusive or and exclusive or. Uh, an inclusive or includes the possibility that both statements are true. Um, an exclusive or would preclude that possibility. So if I say my name is Zachary or my name is Ryan, that statement is going to be true if either one of those statements is true. If it turns out that both of those statements are true, and interestingly enough, both of them are true. My first name is Zachary and my middle name is Ryan. So they're actually both true that my name is Zachary and my name is Ryan. Um, the, the overall disjunct statement Z or R is still true. That compound statement Z wedge R or A or B or P or Q, however you want to express it, uh, any disjunction is true if either of the two statements is true or both of them are true. And we'll, look, we'll talk about the definition of a disjunction uh, more formally by the end of the video. Um, and there are ways of expressing an, an, what's called an exclusive or that excludes the possibility that both statements are true. But in propositional logic, we go with an inclusive or. So um, uh, if, if whenever you have a disjunct like this with a wedge, if Z is true or as R is, is true, or if both statements are true, Z and R, then that disjunction will be, will be true. Okay, moving on, we also have conditionals in English and in, and in logic. And a conditional is basically an English if then statement. And a lot of the challenge in translating statements from English into logical notation has to do with conditionals because we have so many different ways of expressing conditional relationships and if then statements in English. Let's look at some of these. So at the top of the screen, we have two simple statements. Let's let F stand for today is Friday, and let's let S stand for tomorrow is Saturday. The uh, if-then relationship or conditional relationship is expressed by your textbook uh, by this symbol that's called a horseshoe. It also looks like a, uh, a, a symbol from set theory. Same symbol, but here it's called a, a horseshoe, but it's used to represent a conditional relationship. So this statement here, F, horseshoe S would be an if then statement. If today is Friday, in other words, if F, then Saturday, then tomorrow is Saturday or S. So if F, then S. Now, like I said, the challenge here is that there are many, many ways of expressing conditionals in English. Uh, I'm going to run through some of these and you'll get some practice on this in your homework exercises for this week. Um, notice that all of these statements are F, horseshoe S. The first one is really straightforward. It's a straightforward if-then statement. If today is Friday, then tomorrow is Saturday. Same example as above. Notice that sometimes in English, we omit the word then. We say, if today is Friday, we kind of pause, tomorrow is Saturday. That's another way of saying, if today is Friday, then tomorrow is Saturday. We just don't always use the word then in English. Notice that we can sometimes mix around the order. So um, the logical relationship in the third example is exactly the same. It basically says, if today is Friday, then tomorrow is Saturday. But the two components have been, have been reversed. Tomorrow is Saturday, if today is Friday. Before we move on to look at the rest of these examples, I want to talk about the parts of a conditional. The uh, left part, the, uh, the first term to the left of the horseshoe is called the antecedent. It's the hypothetical part of a conditional. And conditionals have this kind of hypothetical connotation. If today is Friday, whether or not it actually is Friday, then something would follow from that. Tomorrow is Saturday. 
So the if part is the antecedent of the conditional and the part that follows then is called the consequent of the conditional. And that can be a helpful way of making sure that you're putting the two terms in the right order. Now notice that some of these uh, logical expressions are reversible, like an, uh, a conjunction A and B, that's reversible. A and B means the same thing as B and A. It says both of those statements are true. A or B means the same thing as B or A. It doesn't matter which order you put them in. But with the conditional, it matters a lot because one of the terms is a hypothetical term. If something, then something else follows from that first term. So if A, then B does not mean the same thing as if B, then A. So these conditionals are not reversible in the same way that conjunctions and disjunctions are reversible, which means you have to pay a lot of attention to which term goes in the right slot, what the antecedent is and what the conditional is. And uh, unfortunately, in ordinary speech, we kind of use these, um, these structures a bit loosey-goosey. So when you're translating your homework exercises, you have to be extremely careful that you're identifying the correct antecedent and the correct consequent of a conditional statement. Um, to make matters worse, so we have the phrase if, but we also have an English phrase only if, which is basically the reverse of an if. Um, so if I say um, tomorrow is Saturday, if today is Friday, in this third example, the part that follows if is actually the antecedent of the conditional. It says if today is Friday, then tomorrow is Saturday, no matter what order they show up in in the sentence. But in the next example, today is Friday only if tomorrow is Saturday. Here, the phrase only if describes a necessary condition. And if you remember, when we looked at conditionals in week one, a necessary condition is the consequent of a conditional, the part that goes to the right of the horseshoe symbol or the word that, or the term that follows, or the statement that follows the term then in a conditional statement. So here, even though we have um, tomorrow is Saturday following only if, um, that's going to be on the right side of the of the horseshoe. It's going to be the necessary condition, not the not the antecedent or the or the sufficient condition. So today is Friday only if tomorrow is Saturday. Uh, to make matters worse, we have all of these other ways of expressing conditional statements in English. Tomorrow is Saturday on the condition that today is Friday. On the condition that is a way of specifying the hypothetical condition or the antecedent or the sufficient condition of a conditional. So in other words, if today is Friday, on the condition that today is Friday, then tomorrow would be Saturday. So even though tomorrow is Saturday comes first in the English sentence, the hypothetical part of the statement or the part that the, uh, the consequent depends on, that antecedent of the conditional, is actually today is Friday. And you'll see here in the logical statement that F comes first because that's the antecedent of the conditional. So if today is Friday, then tomorrow is Saturday. Um, similar to that, in the next example, today's being Friday implies that tomorrow is Saturday. So uh, it can be helpful to try to translate this, these into an ordinary English uh, if-then statement. So if today is Friday, then tomorrow is Saturday. Similar to that, we have today's being Friday is a sufficient condition for tomorrow's being Saturday. Now, if you remember, in, 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 if you have a conditional statement, the antecedent of the conditional is a sufficient condition. In other words, if F is true, in other words, if today it really is Friday, that's sufficient to guarantee that tomorrow is Saturday. So the sufficient condition is the antecedent of the conditional, and the necessary condition is the consequent of the conditional. And I think you can see that from this, this last example. Tomorrow's being Saturday, Saturday is a necessary condition for today's being Friday. In other words, if this statement is true, if F then S, then if Friday is the case, S has to necessarily follow from that. So that's why um, S is on the right side of the horseshoe. It's the consequent of the conditional or the necessary condition that follows from the antecedent, which is today being Friday. So you're going to get a lot of practice on conditionals in your homework exercises. Pay lots of attention to this because I think you can see the problem here. A lot of these phrases sound really similar. The difference between if and only if. The difference between a, a sufficient condition and a necessary condition. Those mean very different things, but they can sound very similar to the ear. So it's important you get a lot of practice on translating English con, uh, statements into, into conditionals uh, and identifying the correct antecedent and the correct consequent, putting the two terms in the correct order in a condition additional statement. It's not as, as easy as it looks, as you might, as you might see. You got to make sure you, you read the uh, statements in your homework exercises very carefully and maybe either convert them into an ordinary if-then statement or think about, um, you know, which term is a sufficient condition or which term is a necessary condition and whatnot. 
So uh, again, your, your textbook uses this uh, symbol called the horseshoe to represent a conditional. Other textbooks use an arrow where sometimes this double arrow is used to, um, with two lines and a little, little arrow, two parallel lines and, a, and an arrow uh, indicator. Um, uh, most textbook e textbooks either use this horseshoe symbol or a single arrow to represent a, a conditional statement, but your textbook uses the, the horseshoe. It's kind of a funny name. I get a little kick out of it every time I, I, I see the term horseshoe and it makes me smile. It's just such a funny, uh, cute term for, for the name of that symbol. Moving on. To make matters worse, while we're talking about conditionals, English also has what are called biconditionals. And <clears throat> The name, I think, really makes biconditionals really clear. A biconditional is a conditional that goes both directions. So if you have two statements like E and O here, E being the number two is even and O being the number three is odd, this would be a biconditional. And the biconditional is represented by this triple bar symbol. Um, that basically corresponds to a, a conditional that goes both ways. It means if E, then O and if O then E. And if you remember the two terms, if and only if are opposite of each other. So this is where we get this strange English phrase, if and only if, it means it's a conditional that goes both ways. If E then O and E only if O, which means if O then E. So if E then O and if O then E, it's a conditional that goes both ways. And there are a few ways that we represent biconditionals in English. The most common is this phrase, if and only if. So um, I've translated these for you here, E biconditional O or E triple bar O. These are just called a biconditional, E biconditional O. That translates to the number two is even, that's E, if and only if O, the number three is, oh, that's supposed to be odd. The number three is odd. In the next statement, we have E biconditional O. That translates to the number two being even is equivalent to the number three being odd. That's another phrase we use, equivalence. And what's interesting about biconditionals is biconditionals basically mean equivalence as well. If one is true, the other one has to be true. And if one is false, the other one has to be false. It means the two terms, the two simple statements have identical truth values. So that's where we get this phrase is equivalent to or logically equivalent to sometimes. In the third example, we've got E by conditional O, the number two being even, is a sufficient and a necessary condition for three being odd. So again, remember the two parts of a conditional are the sufficient and the necessary condition. The antecedent of a conditional is the sufficient condition and the consequent of a conditional is a necessary condition. So if it's a biconditional that goes both ways, one of the terms is both sufficient and necessary for the other. In other words, the conditional goes both ways. And what I've done to make this point really clear a biconditional is equivalent to a complex expression like this in logic. If E, then O, and if E, the, if O, then E. And I'll explain parentheses here in a bit, but I think you can gather the meaning of this pretty intuitively. I'll just read it from left to right. Remember, we have a horseshoe here. That's a conditional. If E, then O, and, that's what the dot is, if O, then E. So translating this into English, if the number two is even, then the number three is odd and vice versa. If the number three is odd, then the number two is even. It's a conditional that goes both ways. So a biconditional is equivalent to the conjunction of two conditionals which are opposite of each other. Just to recap, um, the symbol name for the, for the uh, biconditional is a triple bar. Sometimes it's called material equivalence. Sometimes it's just called a biconditional. Uh, other textbooks use a double arrow like this, an arrow with uh, pointing both directions or a double arrow pointing in both directions. But your textbook uses this triple bar to connote that the, it's, a, it's a double conditional, a conditional that goes one way and a conditional that goes the other way. I actually prefer this double arrow symbol. I think it makes the meaning a lot clearer. You know, it's, it's an arrow that goes that way and it's an arrow that goes the other way uh, from one term to the other. But you won't go wrong if you stick to the phrase if and only if or is equivalent to or is a sufficient and necessary condition. So those are the, the five um, logic operators in propositional logic. You can see there's not very, there, very much to remember in the way of symbols. All of the challenge comes in terms of translating from English into logic notation correctly, given the many ways that we mix up these phrases in English, which is great. It means we have a really rich language. It's great for creative writing. It's great for poetry. It's great for expressing yourself with nuance. But when you're trying to represent the structure of an English statement in logical notation, you have to strip away all of that variation in English and get to the logical structure going on in the language. 
it's one of the most common ways that people misuse, misuse language is to misuse some of these grammatical forms. You know, saying something with a conditional that they, they meant to say another way or saying something with a biconditional that they meant to say with a conditional or whatnot. Um, so this is one of the really practical implications of learning logic well. You can start to pay a little better attention to what exactly you're saying in the statements that you're saying when you're expressing yourself in your writing or in your speaking, making sure that you're actually saying the thing you really intend to say. And also, it can be a bit of a challenge to discern the logical structure of an ordinary language statement that you encounter out there in the wild. I want to spend a moment and talk about parentheses with compound statements. So we've been looking at very simple compound statements that only have two terms, but compound statements in English and in logic can get very compound. You can take a statement, connect it to another statement with an operator, take that and treat it as a whole unit and connect it to yet another statement with an operator and so on and so forth. So you can get very, very lengthy compound propositions and you use parentheses or parenthetical marks like parentheses, square brackets, and curly braces to um, create the divisions to um, disambiguate the meaning of a statement, to create the groupings of which two bits of language are being connected by any particular operator. So let's look at an example of this. I think this will be really easy to follow. At the top of your screen, I've got three simple statements. Let's let W stand for Harry Potter is a wizard. Let's let Q stand for Harry Potter plays Quidditch which he does inside Harry Potter, if you've read the book or uh, seen the movie. And let's let S stand for Harry Potter casts spells. And here's our ordinary English statement. If Harry Potter is a wizard, then he casts spells and plays Quidditch. And you can see that all three of these statements, simple statements, are inside this long compound statement. First one here, Harry Potter is a wizard. The second one being Harry Potter cast spells, just very short here, he cast spells, but that's Harry Potter cast spells and plays Quidditch, which is Harry Potter plays Quidditch. Now the challenge here is to represent the structure of this using letters and symbols. So what I've done, I've translated it for you. Notice here that we have an if then statement. If Harry Potter is a wizard, then everything else in this sentence follows from that. So we have if W, then, and we've used the horseshoe to represent that, the left side of the horseshoe being the antecedent or the if part. So if Harry Potter is a wizard or if W, then everything else that follows. Now, what you have to notice here is that what follows the word then are, is, is itself a compound statement. He casts spells and plays Quidditch. So Harry Potter casts spells and Harry Potter plays Quidditch. And you need a way to represent that compound expression as the antecedent of the conditional statement. So if Harry Potter is a wizard, then something complex needs to follow. And we've used parentheses to do that. Uh, and what follows, of course, is a conjunction, S and Q, Harry Potter casts spells and Harry Potter plays Quidditch. So if W, then, that's what the horseshoe represents, parentheses to create the grouping, uh, S and Q, Harry Potter casts spells and Harry Potter plays Quidditch. Now, technically, every time you use one of these two place operators, there needs to be another set of parenthetical marks around the entire thing. So technically, there should be a set of outer markings here, um, which I've represented with these square brackets. Your textbook tends to leave them off and most people tend to leave them off, but they're important to add because every time you, you create a compound proposition, if you wanna connect that to another compound proposition, there has to be some parentheses around it to, to be able to treat that compound proposition as a single grouping. So technically they should be there, but it's very, very common to drop the outermost set of, of parentheses or brackets or braces uh, and leave them out, even though strictly speaking, they should be there. And that's what I've got here. Um, Generally, it doesn't really, strictly speaking, matter the order that you use, you know, whether you use uh, parentheses or brackets or braces, but technically, you know, the, the first level of, of, of parenthetical marks, like the innermost ones, tend to be parentheses. Then if you need another level uh, outside of that, you tend to use square brackets. And if you need another level, you tend to use curly braces. And uh, if, if you need to keep expanding, have a massively complex proposition, you can just use more curly braces. Um, you could use all parentheses even, and it would be fine, but your textbook tends to use uh, parentheses and then square brackets and then squ uh, curly braces outside those if you need to nest them in that way. So don't worry about this very intimidating looking statement down at the bottom of the screen. 
I've, I've put such a complex statement here so early on in the, in the lecture today, so you can get a sense of how these parentheses are used. So for example, you know, nested inside this complex statement here, we've got a wedge and there are two terms being connected, Q or S, and there are parentheses around that. But that grouping, Q or S, as a unit grouped by those parentheses is connected to this other unit in parentheses, if S then Q, again in parentheses, and those are connected together by a biconditional, if and only if. But that's not all, right? All of that is treated as a single unit and is connected to this other parenthetical statement, Q and S, which is in parentheses by this horseshoe. So this horseshoe says, if this unit in parentheses, Q and S, then everything inside these curly brackets, or these square braces, um, square brackets, excuse me, Q or S is equivalent to S implies Q. But that's not all. All of that is being treated as a single unit with these curly braces right here and right here. And that as a single unit is the antecedent of a conditional. We have a horseshoe and then W is just the consequent of the conditional. So if all of this, whatever it means, then Harry Potter is a wizard, then W. So you can see that parentheses and brackets and braces can be really useful for um, forming these massively complex statements. And you know this looks really scary right now, but in a week or two, this will be second nature and you're gonna be looking at statements like this and it won't, it won't give you any pause whatsoever. You'll be able to breeze right through this. Um, I should say too, and we're gonna talk about this here in a minute, but for every long statement like this, there's a main operator. And I think you can see here that the main operator is this horseshoe. It says, if all of this, inside these curly braces, then W. And each of these other operators applies to a, real, a smaller portion of that, of that statement. So this dot here just connects Q and S, but it doesn't apply to anything else in the statement. Same thing with this wedge, it just connects Q and S, but it doesn't, doesn't connect to anything else in the statement. This um, triple bar, this biconditional, connects this statement in parentheses and this statement in parentheses, but it doesn't apply to anything else in the statement. The only operator that covers the entire statement is this horseshoe. So this is one big if then statement. If all of this stuff to the left, then W. So that's how parentheses and brackets and braces are used in logic notation. If you just went with all parentheses, that would be fine, but your textbook uses these three different types of markings to make it easier to see where the natural uh, nesting and groupings are, to see what the, what the innermost levels are and what the outermost levels are of the parentheses. I want to look at some common uh, English statement forms and how they're translated into logical notation. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this because we need to move on past natural language to looking at formal methods for evaluating arguments in symbolic notation. But it is important to disambiguate between these different kinds of English statements, which are very easy to confuse with each other. So I just want to run through these and talk about the meaning of them and show why, why, why they're different from each other, why they're actually uh, different, different statements that say different things, even though they sound very similar to our ears. So the first statement is something like this, not either A or B. Now, if you just look at A or B on its own, that means one of the two statements is true, either A or B. Not either is basically a negation of that entire either or statement. It says it's not the case or it's false that either A or B, not either e, A or B. So basically A or B, this disjunction is treated as a unit in parentheses and the negation that tilde negates the entire either or statement. It says it's false that either A or B with A or B being treated as a single unit as a compound statement. Now the next statement sounds very similar but means something very, very different. Either not A or not B. What that says is either A is false, so either not A or not B either A is false or B is false. Notice that the first statement here, not, it's not the case that A or B or not either A or B, precludes the possibility that either statement is true, right? If you ignore the, uh, the tilde and just say A or B, that says either A is true or B is true. One of the two has to be true. And if you negate that, that says it's not the case that either one is true. So both have to be false. The second statement, however, not A or not B, just says that one of the two is false. Either A is false 
or B is false, but the other one could be true even if one of them is false. So this first statement precludes the possibility that either A or B is true, and the second statement allows that one of them might be true if at least one of them is false. But they sound very similar to the ears, not either A or B. That does not mean the same thing as either not A or not B. And we'll be able to show this formally starting uh, um, next week. We're going to look at the truth table method for, for showing which types of statements are equivalent to each other logically and which types of statements are not equivalent to each other logically. Um, we're going to talk about that next week. But I think, I, I think if you take the time to think through the these two examples, you'll see that they sound very similar but mean two very different things. Not either A or B. Um, doesn't allow the possibility that A is true or B is true. Both have to be false, right? It's not the case that either one is true. And the second example says either A is false or B is false. One of them is false, but the other one might still be true. And so those two statements don't mean the same thing. In the next two examples right here, we have a, a very similar situation using a, an English conjunction, not both A and B. <clears throat> So both A and B is just a conjunction, A dot B. And if you have not both A and B, it's the negation of that conjunction. It says it's not the case that A and B are both true. Another way to think about this, this third example on the, on the screen here, is that it's false that A and B are both true. And that means one of them has to be false, or both, but it can't be the case that both of them are true at the same time. <clears throat> um, the fourth example on the screen, it sounds very similar again, but it means something very different. Both not A and not B. That says A is false and B is false. Both of them have to be false. A has to be false and B has to be false. This example right above though says, it's just the case that both of them aren't true. In other words, A could, still be, could be true as long as B is false, or B could be true as long as A is false. They just can't both be true at the same time. But this statement here says they're both false. A has to be false and B has to be false as well. So they sound very similar to the ears, but they mean two very different things. So let's look at these last two examples on the screen. What's interesting about these last two examples is that they're the same exact phrase in English, but they're translated into logical notation in two different ways. And in fact, these two different statements in logical notation, the last two on the screen, are logically equivalent to each other, even though they use a different combination of symbols. So for example, uh, neither A nor B in English basically means it's not the case that either A or B, and that's, that's what neither nor means. It's not the case that either or, that's where neither came from. Uh, that means it's not the case, so that's why we have a tilde here, that either A or B. So A or B as a disjunction is treated as a unit with parentheses, and that entire disjunction is being negated with that tilde in front of it. It's not the case that either A or B. But notice that means if it's not the case that either A or B, that means both A and B have to be false. Neither one is true, right? So neither A nor B also means it's false that A and it's false that B, not A and not B. And in fact, these two statements are logically equivalent to each other. So you'll get some practice on, on statements like this in your homework exercises. Again, you'll have to go very slowly and carefully because it's very easy to confuse these forms that sound similar in English and look similar to each other in logical notation, but actually mean very different things. And your textbook has plenty of examples on this. You'll get plenty of practice on this in your homework exercises. I hope looking at some of these examples together have helped uh, and you'll get lots of practice on this in your homework. But do go through these slowly and carefully to make sure you're doing these correct in your exercises. Moving on, I want to talk about the formal definition of each of these logical symbols. And the way these symbols are, are defined is in terms of what's called a truth table. Um, you might have heard the expression truth table before, and we're going to look at some truth tables now. And these logical symbols are defined in terms of truth values. So for example, if you have a statement like P, and this is actually technically called a statement variable. It's a statement that stands for other statements. So any old statement you want, simple statement, compound statement, whatever, plug anything you want in for P. There are only two possibilities, right? There are two possible truth values. P is either true or it's false. And if you have the negation of that, then the negation is going to have the opposite value of P, right? So if P is true, then not P is going to be false. And if P is false, 
the not be is going to be true. In other words, the negation symbol just has the opposite truth value of the statement that it's negating. And I think this makes perfect sense. And you can see why the truth table only has two rows. There are only two possibilities. P is either true or P is false. And the negation will have the opposite truth value. This entire little table is called a truth table because it lists all the possible combinations of truth values for the statements that are involved. Let's look at a conjunction now. Now, Remember, a conjunction always conjoins two statements, P and Q. Now, P could be something simple, just an atomic statement with a capital letter, or it could stand for itself a compound statement in parentheses, and same thing with Q. But a conjunction always connects two things, something on the left and something on the right, one conjunct and the other conjunct connected with a, with a dot, which means that there are always going to be four possible combinations of truth values. No matter what you plug in for P, no matter what you plug in for Q, there are only four possible combinations of truth values. Either P and Q are both true, that's what's going on here in the first row, or P is true and Q is false, or vice versa, P is false and Q is true, or P and Q are both false, and that's what's going on in the last row. And I think if you, if you pay attention to how we use uh, a conjunction in English, it basically corresponds to the English word and. So a, a conjunction is going to be true if the two conjuncts are both true. If P and Q are both true, then P dot Q will be true. And if they're not both true, if one of them or both of them are false, then the overall conjunction is going to be false. And that's what's going on in this truth table. And if we go row by row by row, you can see that. If P and Q are both true, that's what's going on here in this first row. P is, Q, is true, Q is true. Therefore, the conjunction P dot Q is true. But if either of the statements is false, like in the second row, P is true, but Q is false, it's not the case that they're both true. So P dot Q would be false. And that's represented with an F here to represent that the, the conjunction P dot Q is false. Same thing if it's vice versa, if P is false, but Q is true. It's not the case that both P and Q are true. It's false that they're both true. So the conjunction P dot Q would be false. And same thing in the last row, if P is false and Q is false. It's still false that both P and Q are true. It's not the case that they're both true. So P dot Q is false. So the only time a conjunction is true is if P and Q, both conjuncts, whatever on, whatever's on the left of the dot and whatever's on the right of the dot are both true, then you end up with a true statement. In all the other cases, you end up with a false statement. Moving on, let's look at a disjunction, an either or statement. And you can see that an either or statement means something very different. If I say something like either A is true or B is true, that's gonna be true if either A is true or B is true, if at least one of the two disjuncts is true. And if we go down the truth table, you can see how this plays out. P and Q, if P is true and Q is true, the question to ask is, is it the case that at least one of the two statements, P or Q is true? And the answer here is yes, at least one of them is true. So the disjunction is true. Same thing in the second row. If P is true and Q is false, then at least one of them is true, right? Either P is Q is true or Q is true. At least one of them is true, in other words. So the disjunction P or Q is true. Same thing in the third row. If uh, P is false, but Q is true, at least one of them is true. So P or Q, P wedge Q is true. Now in the last row, it's not the case that at least one of them is true. P is false and Q is false. It's so because it's not the case that at least one of them is true, they're both false, in other words, the disjunction is false. And that's the only row in the truth table in which a disjunction is false, if the two disjuncts are both false. And this corresponds exactly to how we use most either or statements in English, with the exception of exclusive or that I'll talk about at another time. There are also uh, conditionals. Um, I mentioned this a, a bit ago, but conditionals are also called material implication. Don't worry too much about the, the, the second term, material implication. Um, I think you can see why, um, you know, if you have a phrase like if P then Q, that's equivalent to P implies Q. That's why it's called material implication. Um, the truth table for, for a conditional is a little harder to understand because we use conditionals in a lot of different ways in English and only some of which correspond to how they're, they're expressed in propositional logic. And there are other ways of handling uh, different types of if-then statements in English that don't correspond to this truth table. But this is how material implication or most conditionals are translated into, uh, into propositional logic. And I'll, I'll talk about why here in a minute. 
what's distinctive about the, the uh, truth table for a conditional is that there's only one row where you end up with a false conditional. That's when the antecedent is true, but the consequent is false. If that's the case, a true antecedent, but a false consequent, then you end up with a false conditional. In all the other rows, you end up with a true conditional. And that's not obvious at all. So if you have if P then Q, but P is false and Q is false, the conditional would still end up true. And that's a really strange result that doesn't really correspond to how we use all of our uh, if then statements in English. I'm going to try to give you an example that will help make, uh, make this a little clearer. And I, I hope this example helps make this intuitive for you. If I gave you a conditional statement that was like this, it's going to be an if-then statement. So if you do all your homework in this logic class, then you will get an A. Now, that's not actually true. But if, let's just assume that it's true. There's, you, have, you have to actually do well in your homework to get an A as well. But let's just say that were the conditional statement. statement. If you do all your homework in this class, you'll get an A in the class. Let's go through these different possibilities. If you get an A on your homework and you get an A in the class, or if you do all your homework and you get an A in the class, in other words, if P and Q are both true, I think it makes sense that the conditional would end up being true. Um, and I think it's, it's obviously false that if you, if you did all your homework, but you didn't get an A in the class, it would have been false that if you did all your homework, then you'll get an A in the class, right? That would be a, a false statement because you did all your homework, but you didn't get an A in the class. so that conditional is false. Where things start to get a little weird are in the third and fourth rows here. So if I said to you, if you do, get an, do all of your homework in the class, you'll get an A in the class. Suppose you didn't do all of your homework, but you still got an A in the class. Maybe you did some extra credit assignment and you still got enough points to get an A. It was, still would have been true that if you had done all of your your uh, homework in the class, you would have gotten an A in the class. In other words, the conditional would still have been true even if the antecedent were false, even if you didn't meet that hypothetical condition at the beginning that I, that I, that I indicated. Same thing um, in the last row. So if I said, if P then Q, if you do all of your homework, then you'll get an A in the class. Suppose you didn't do all of your homework and you didn't get an A in the class. In other words, if P and Q were both false, it still would have been true that if you had gotten A and done all of your homework, then you would have gotten A in the class. And that conditional statement would still have been true, even if both of the, the two um, uh, terms involved, the antecedent and the consequent, were false. The only time that conditional would be false is if you had done all your homework, but you didn't get an A in the class, then it would have been false that if you did uh, all your homework, then you would have gotten an A in the class and that conditional would be false. I hope that example makes uh, conditionals make a little, uh, little more sense to you. If not, you may just have to memorize this. There's only one row or one, one situation where a conditional is false, and that's when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. In all other possible combinations of truth value, you end up with a true conditional, and you might just have to memorize that unless you can make it intuitive for yourself, and I hope that example helps. Let's talk now about biconditionals. Uh, sometimes biconditionals are called material equivalents. And I think you can see why from looking at the truth table now. Uh, and again, a biconditional is a, is a conditional that goes both ways. If P then Q and if Q then P. That's why it's called a biconditional. But the truth table helps make it uh, clear why a biconditional is also called material equivalents. In other words, a, a biconditional like P biconditional Q or B triple bar Q is going to be true if the two terms involved, P and Q, have identical truth values. If they're both true or they're both false, you end up with a true statement. If they have different truth values, in other words, if they're not equivalent to each other, you end up with a false biconditional. So let's go down the truth table and you can see this. In the first row, P and Q are both true, but they have equivalent truth values, so the, the biconditional is true. Same thing in the last row down here. P is false and Q is false, but they are equivalent. They have equivalent truth values, so the biconditional will be true. In the middle two rows though, the two, the two uh, statements have different truth values. In, in the second row here, P is true, but Q is false. They're not equivalent, so the biconditional is false. Same thing in the third row, P is false, Q is true. Those aren't equivalent, so the biconditional is false. So I think the name here, material equivalent, really helps understand, helps you understand the definition of a, of a biconditional uh, given the truth table here. Uh, if the two terms involved are equivalent, you have a true statement. If they're not equivalent, you have a false statement. 
And those are the truth tables that are the definitions of these five operators. And all of propositional logic that we're going to look at for the next several weeks depends on these five operators and these truth table definitions. So please, please, please spend plenty of time looking at the truth tables for these symbols, commit them to memory, get some practice on them, make sure you do the exercises because it's the only way you're going to uh, commit, you know, commit these uh, truth tables and commit these symbols to memory and have an intuitive sense of their, of their meaning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moving on, I want to talk about uh, main operators. Every compound proposition in propositional logic has a main operator. And the main operator, uh, you can see here in the second, second bullet point, is the operator with the largest scope. In other words, it governs the entirety of the, state, of the statement. Some statements have a smaller scope, or um, excuse me, some logic symbols have a smaller scope and some logic symbols have a larger scope in a compound statement. And I've got a couple of examples here to make this clear. In example one, we have a statement. Uh, the main operator here is this horseshoe. It says, if all of this in parentheses, which is, it's, we'll worry about that in a minute, but whatever it is, if everything in parentheses there, then C. And notice that that governs the entire statement. What's on the left of the horseshoe is everything to the left inside parentheses, and what's on the right of the horseshoe is just this atomic statement C. Uh, that's the scope of the of that operator. Uh, the, the scope is what's on the left of it and what's on the right of it, given the, the parenthetical, gr parenthetical groupings. If you look at this horseshoe by contrast, the scope of this is just what's in parentheses, right? The, the, the excuse me, the wedge um, connects this atomic statement A with this atomic statement B, but it doesn't have anything to do at all with what's outside the parentheses here. So the scope of this wedge is just limited to what's in the parentheses. So that wedge has a smaller scope than this horseshoe. The horseshoe exhausts the entire statement, everything to the left, including what's in parentheses and C to the right. So this is the main operator because it has the largest scope. And every compound proposition in propositional logic will have one and only one main operator. In example two, again, this looks like a scary example, but it's really not. If you, if you look at all the operators, it should be really easy to tell which one of them is the main one. <clears throat> It can't be this wet, this uh, triple bar here because the triple bar only connects A and only connects B, right? It doesn't apply at all to anything else in this entire statement. So it has a fairly small scope and it doesn't exhaust the entire statement. So that is not the main operator. Uh, let's jump around a bit here. How about this horseshoe? Same situation, right? That horseshoe cannot be the main operator. That horseshoe connects C with A. It basically says, if C, then A. But it doesn't relate at all to anything else in this compound statement. It has a fairly small scope, and it does not exhaust the entire statement. So that cannot be the main operator. How about this dot? <clears throat> the dot's a little trickier. The dot actually connects this statement here in parentheses, if C, then A. That's what's immediately to the left of the dot, with B. So those are the two components of, of, of this conjunction. It says C implies A, that's what the horseshoe says, and B, but that's the scope of the dot. It doesn't affect anything way over here. So that can't be the main operator. It's a, it has a slightly larger scope than this horseshoe, but it still doesn't exhaust the entire statement. So that's not the main operator. But if you look at this wedge, this disjunction here, the wedge uh, connects what's to the left, which is this entire expression in parentheses, A by conditional B, or A is equivalent to B. And what's to the right of the wedge is everything inside these brackets. C implies A and B, but all of that is contained in these two square brackets. And notice that those two things, you know, what's to the left here in parentheses and what's to the right in the brackets, that exhausts the entire statement. So this wedge has the largest scope of any operator in that statement, and it exhausts the entire statement. So that wedge, excuse me, so that wedge right there is the main operator. And every statement in logical and propositional logic will have one and only one main operator. It's the operator that governs the largest components of the statement, exhausts the entire statement. If you have a, 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 an operator with a smaller scope or where, where the operator doesn't govern the entire statement, that cannot be the main operator. Should be pretty straightforward, I think. So uh, statements in, in propositional logic are called truth functional. Uh, and that basically means that the truth value of a compound statement 
is determined by the truth value of the simple statements that make that up. And you can see that even in the simplest statement. So if you have a conjunction like A dot B, that conjunction is going to be true if A and B are true, and it's going to be false if they're not both true. So the truth value of the entire conjunction is a function of or is determined by, completely determined by the truth values of the simple statements that make up that compound expression. And every statement in propositional logic is truth functional. That means its overall truth value is determined by the truth value of all the simple statements within that compound statement. And I put a very simple example on the screen here, and we're going to look at more complex examples in the second half of this video uh, coming up here in just a bit. So here's my simple example. Uh, it's an if-then statement. If you notice, the main operator here is this horseshoe. It says, if everything here in parentheses, so if A or B, if all that is the case, then C. And just for, to reiterate here, this wedge can't be the main operator because it only governs what's in parentheses, right? It connects A with B, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't apply to anything else in the statement. Whereas this horseshoe connects everything in in, on the left in parentheses and C on the right, it has a larger scope, so that horseshoe is the main operator. So if I plug in some truth values here, let's assume A is true, and let's assume B is false, and let's assume C is false we should be able to determine whether this overall statement is true. So what you do to start um, calculating the truth value of a compound statement in propositional logic, you start by plugging in the truth values that you're given, the known truth values of these simple statements. And I'm gonna do that right below each of these statements. So if we assume A is true, we're gonna plug in a T right below A to indicate that A is true. And if we're gonna assume B is false, we're gonna plug in an F right there underneath B to indicate that B is false. And then we're gonna plug in F right underneath C because the information tells us that C is false. Now what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna start with the operators that have the smallest scope. In other words, the innermost uh, um, operators inside a compound expression that are nested inside those parentheses. And we're gonna kind of work our way out until we get to the main operator. So let's start right here we have a disjunction, A or B inside parentheses. So we're starting with a connective that's nested as far down inside the statement, deepest in parentheses that we can find. And we're gonna to try to calculate the value for each operator. So if A is true and B is false, this is a disjunction. And if you remember, a disjunction is gonna be true if at least one of the two disjuncts is true, right? A or B. And here it's the case that at least one of them is true. A is true. So that disjunction is true. And I'm gonna enter a T right below the operator to indicate that that operator is true. In other words, A or B, that compound expression inside parentheses is true because that's the value that's below the operator there. So how about the overall statement, the if then statement, if all of this in parentheses, then C. So what you have to do here, you have, you have to find the truth values in question. So this, this operator, the horseshoe, um, connects this parenthetical expression, A or B, and the main operator inside those parentheses is this, is this wedge, the true, the true truth value right underneath the wedge. So basically says, um, this truth value right here under the wedge is being connected with the truth value under C by this horseshoe. And if you remember, a horseshoe only has one case when it's false. It's when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And here we have a true antecedent. This entire either or statement is true. So something true implying something false, and that's gonna give us a false conditional. And the truth value that you end up with underneath the main operator is gonna be the truth value of the overall expression. So this overall compound expression, this large either or statement, is false because that's the value we ended up with underneath the main operator. And every statement, no matter how massive it looks in propositional logic, will have one and only one main operator and will have a definite truth value that's generated by the truth values of the simple statements that make up that compound expression. So to calculate the truth values of, uh, of compound expressions, again, you start by plugging in your truth values and start calculating away, determining the truth values of each operator, starting with the ones that are nested furthest inside the parentheses. In other words, the operators with the smallest scope and working your way outwards until you get to the main operator. And we're gonna look at some more complex examples um, by the end of this video. I'm gonna go ahead and take a break, refill my coffee. I'm gonna come back and we're gonna look at lots and lots of specific examples uh, of various difficulty levels of everything we've talked about 
about in the video so far. It'll be instantaneous for you, but I'll be back in a few minutes and we're gonna look at a ton of examples. See you in just a minute. Okay, hi everyone, we are back and we are gonna look now at many, many examples of everything we've talked about so far. How to translate statements from English into logical notation, how to identify the main operator of a compound propositional logic uh, statement, and how to evaluate the truth value of a, uh, or determine the truth value of a compound statement in propositional logic from the truth values of uh, the statement's components, what the textbook calls truth functions, because the truth function of a compound statement is a function of, or is determined by the truth value of the simple statements that make up that compound expression. Uh, here on the screen, just a quick recap, you've got five operators in propositional logic. The tilde is a negation. It's a one place operator that negates what's immediately to the right of it. And it's used to translate things like not, or it is not the case that, or it is false that in English. Uh, the dot is a conjunction, basically corresponds to English and also moreover, however, and but, things that are a logical conjunction in English saying that two things are true. A wedge is an either or statement, it, uh, what, what we call a disjunction in logic that's used to tra translate or or either or, and the textbook recommends you translate uh, unless using a wedge as well. I wanna flag this just a little bit because even though the textbook recommends um, translating unless with a wedge, you can also translate it as if not as well, and that can be a handy tip to uh, provide a more intuitive translation of unless in, uh, in logical notation instead of this disjunction. A horseshoe is a conditional or an either or statement. Basically uh, uh, corresponds to what's called implication, material implication it's sometimes called. And uh, that corresponds to an English if then statement. It also can be used to translate only if. Remember if and only if are opposite of each other. If something says something if something versus something only if something, that's a conditional that will go one way or the other. And then of course the English phrase implies. Finally, we have the triple bar, what's called equivalence or a biconditional, and that is used to translate phrases like if and only if, or necessary and sufficient in English. So let's do a few examples. Um, in these first exercises, you're just being asked you know, what symbol you would use. So you're given an English statement and you have to indicate, you know, what symbol would you generally use even without even doing the translation. The first step is figuring out what symbol you even need. So let's look at a couple of these. If the resistor has a gold band, then the resistor has a tolerance rating of 5%. Well, this is just an either, uh, an if then statement, right? If this, then that. If, if the resistor has a gold band, then the resistor has a tolerance rating of 5%. Um, the meaning of the statement statements aside, this is gonna be a conditional. So we would translate that using the horseshoe operator. Either Nevada is a Western state or Georgia is a Western state. Well, that is an either or statement, either this statement here or this statement here, either Nevada is a Western state or Georgia is a Western state. And because it's a disjunction, an either or statement, we would translate that using the wedge operator, a disjunction. Plato was a student of Socrates and Aristotle was a student of Plato. Notice that this is a conjunction. You see the word and here that tells you that two things are true. It says Plato was a student of Socrates and it's also true that Aristotle was a student of Plato. So this is a conjunction, which you would translate using the dot operator. This month is July, if and only if next month is August. So we have this interesting phrase here, if and only if. Again, so that's a conditional that goes both ways, something if something and something only if something. So because it's a biconditional, we would translate that with the triple bar. Plato was not a student of Aristotle. Now notice there aren't two statements here. This is just the negation of a single statement. The single statement would be Plato was a student of Aristotle and the negation of that would be Plato was not a student of Aristotle. So this is just a simple negation and we would translate that using the tilde or the negation operator. William Jefferson Clinton was the 42nd president of the United States or George W. Bush was the 42nd president of the United States. So even though this is a fairly lengthy statement, it's really just an either or statement. Either this first part, William Jefferson Clinton was the 42nd president of the United States or George W. Bush was. So this is a fairly lengthy either or statement and we would translate that using the wedge. Okay, moving on. Again, same apologies as last time. It takes a minute for these statements to load and I wanna blow them up on the screen here to make them a little easier on your eyes when you're watching this video. 
So now we want to get some practice identifying the main operator of a statement. So you're given some fairly lengthy compound propositions and propositional logic here, all of which have a main operator. And if you remember, the main operator of a compound proposition is the operator with the largest scope that exhausts the overall statement. So we can look at these various operators and look at what their scope is, and we should be able to zero in on which one of these is the main operator. So let's start way over here. Just, uh, it doesn't really matter where you start. You just wanna kind of check all of them and see how, how, uh, what the scope of, of, of the operator is. This negation here, this tilde, that only applies to this x. It negates what's immediately to the right of it. So that can't be the main operator because it has such a small scope and it only applies to that one letter x and doesn't affect anything else in the statement. So that can't be the main operator. Same thing with this tilde right here. That just applies to the letter a, so that can't be the main operator. This, the rest of the statement is left untouched by that. How about this horseshoe? Well, this horseshoe is actually uh, connecting these two negations. It's connecting not A and it's connecting not X. So the two, the two values that it's uh, connecting are the value under this negation and the value under this negation. Uh, we don't know what the truth values are. That's not part of the exercise yet, but um, it still has a fairly small scope. This conditional only applies to what's inside the parentheses. It doesn't apply to anything outside the parentheses. So that can't be the main operator either. either. And you have the same situation over here on the left side, right? This, uh, this negation here only applies to the X, so that can't be the main operator. And this biconditional here only applies to this negation. It connects P and it connects this negation, only applies to what's inside the parentheses, in other words. So the scope is still pretty small. It doesn't exhaust the entire statement, so that can't be the main operator. But if you look at this dot right here in the middle, that connects what's immediately on the left, but what's on the left of the dot is everything in parentheses as a unit, right? That's the left side of the dot. And the right side of the dot is everything in these parentheses. And that exhausts the entire statement it has the largest scope of any operator. So that would be the main operator of that statement. So again, the main operator is the operator that has the largest scope and in doing so it will exhaust the entire statement. So let's get a little practice on these. Um, Let's just go from left to right and we'll see, uh, we'll see what we end up with. Um, this dot connects the X and it connects not E. So that dot only applies to what's inside these parentheses. So that can't be the main operator. And obviously this tilde only applies to E. It just negates what's immediately to the right of it. So that can't be the main operator either. That's all still inside those parentheses. Um, but this dot, if you notice, now we're on to something. This dot connects this entire set of parentheses on the left with this negation on the right. And this negation applies to these parentheses. So this dot connects the parentheses on the left with the negation of the parentheses on the right. That would be the main operator because that exhausts the entire statement. And if we keep going, we can just check our work here, right? This negation here only applies to the parentheses on the right. It doesn't apply to anything on the left. So that can't be the main operator. This negation here, this tilde only applies to the X, so that can't be the main operator. And this horseshoe only connects the things that are inside the parentheses, this negation of X and A. So pretty small scope, that can't be the main operator. This dot here that governs the entire statement would be the main operator. We have a slightly longer example here, all using the same uh, connective, interestingly enough, all using a biconditional. But let's check them one at a time. I'm gonna start on the right just for kicks. Um, this biconditional here, this triple bar, if you notice on the left, it, it connects this expression in parentheses, P is equivalent to P, and this letter P here. But that leaves everything to the left untouched, so that can't be the main operator. And same thing with this biconditional right here, um, the second from the right. That only applies to these two atomic statements, P and P, which happen to be the same statement, but two instances of it. So that can't be the main operator either. The scope is so small. Uh, moving over to the, to the next one over, um, this uh, triple bar right here, that connects everything in this little parenthesis, P is equivalent to P, and th that also connects to everything inside these square brackets, if you see that, right? So what's to the right of the spy conditional is a bracket, and then it governs everything inside that bracket all the way up to here. But notice that that doesn't apply to anything outside these curly braces over here on the left. So that still, it has a pretty large scope, but it's not the largest scope of, the, uh, of all the operators. In fact, um, continuing, moving from right to left, 
we've got P is equivalent to P. This biconditional here only applies to what's inside these, this uh, fairly small parenthetical expression. So that can't be the main operator. But way out here on the left, we've got another biconditional. It connects this atomic statement P, that's what's immediately to its left, and everything immediately to the right from this curly brace all the way to the other curly brace right here. All of that is a single unit, which is fairly lengthy, but it's still treated as a single unit. And that exhausts the entire statement. So that first biconditional there on the left would be the main operator because that governs the entire statement. Moving on. Let's see what we've got here. Um, we have a negation and we've got a fairly large expression in the brackets. And I think without even looking at everything else inside these, these curly braces, I think you can see that this negation negates everything that follows as a single unit. So all this entire expression from this left curly brace to this right curly brace is treated as a single unit and this negation applies to all of it and that exhausts the entire statement. So that would be the main operator. We don't even have to look at anything else inside that statement to know that that's the, that first tilde is the main operator. And then we have a much larger example here. Um, let's see what we've got. I see right off the bat that we've got a parenthetical expression here, X and E. We've got a dot and then to the right of the dot, we have a fairly lengthy expression in, in square brackets, a left square bracket here and a right square bracket here with a dot in between. Um, if we treat this entire uh, expression in square brackets as a single unit, I think we can see pretty easily that this dot has to be the main operator. It governs this, governs this expression in parentheses to the left and governs this fairly long expression in square brackets to the right. And that governs the entire statement. There's nothing else left over. So that dot would be the main operator. And if you look at any other operator in this expression, you'll see that the scope is a smaller scope. So this negation here only applies to H, so that can't be the main operator. This um, biconditional connects P and it connects not H. So that has a fairly small scope and that can't be the main operator. This negation here only applies to what's immediately in these parentheses, right, as a single unit. This negation negates this entire, parenthes this entire parenthetical expression right here that I'm circling. So that can't be the main operator. Same thing with this horseshoe here. This horseshoe, this conditional, governs this small parenthetical expression right here and this negation to the right, but that leaves all this stuff hanging out outside to the left untouched, so that uh, horseshoe can't be the main operator. And I think you see the pattern here. It's only this dot that can be the main operator because it governs what's immediately to the left, this parenthetical expression. This governs this fairly long expression in square brackets to the right, and that exhausts the entire statement, so this dot is conjunction is the main operator. Pretty straightforward. Let's move on. One important concept that I want you to understand is the concept of a well-formed formula. I think you can see that there's a correct use of each one of these symbols. A negation symbol, a tilde, has to apply to something immediately to the right of it. And every um, two-place operator, be it the dot, which is a conjunction, or a wedge, which is a disjunction, or the horseshoe, which is an if-then statement, or a biconditional, which is an, uh, uh, an equivalence or a, a, a kind of a bidirectional um, uh, implication, those are two-place operators. They connect two, two statements, either simple statements or comp compound statements, but two statements are connected with a, with a um, uh, an operator. And every time you use one of these two place operators, a set of parentheses is technically supposed to surround it, although it's common to leave the outer parentheses off. So um, a well-formed formula is basically a correct syntactical use of these symbols to form a valid expression in, in the notation. And if a symbol is out of order, like if you have a stray tilde somewhere that doesn't apply to something immediately to the right of it, you're not going to have a well-formed formula. That's not a correct use of symbols. So let's look at some examples. Um, in this exercise, we basically have to distinguish which of these items are well-formed formulas in propositional logic and which are not. Um, some of these will be obviously wrong and some of these are a little subtle. Like for example, this first expression here, sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals one. That's not propositional logic at all. That might be a perfectly, uh, you know, um, syntactically correct statement in trigonometry, but that has nothing to do with propositional logic. So that's obviously an incorrect answer. 
In the second example, we see a wedge and there is a letter to the right of it, but there's nothing to the left of the wedge but this parenthesis. There's no statement connecting it to the left. So that is not a syntactically correct expression in, in propositional logic. It's not a well-formed formula. So that is not a correct answer either. In the third example, we see two dots together, and that is not how dots are used in logic. For any of these two place operators, there has to be a simple or a compound statement on the left and a simple or a compound statement on the right. And that's not what we have here. We have a dot with another dot next to it, and that's not how the dot works. So that is not a correct uh, use of symbols in propositional logic, not a well-formed formula. In the fourth example, we see a triple bar connected to an I, but there's nothing on the left of the triple bar. And the triple bar is a two place operator. It has to have a simple or a compound statement on the left and a simple or a compound statement on the right. So that is not a correct answer either. So let's see what we have in the next example. I think we're on to something with the next example though. If we check all these operators, we can see that, okay, this horseshoe has a statement on the left and a statement on the right. So that's a correct use of the horseshoe with some parentheses around it. Um, same thing over here. Uh, we've got a horseshoe. It connects this negation of E with M, so that's okay. This dot connects this parenthetical expression with this parenthetical expression, so that dot is being used correctly with square brackets surrounding it. Again, technically speaking, you're supposed to have uh, parentheses or brackets or braces around every instance of a two-place operator. This dot over here connects everything in these square brackets with this negation and this negation is applying to a compound expression on the right, so that's correct. Notice that it's okay here to have these two operators next to each other. This dot is connecting everything in the left in these brackets with this expression as a negation, and that's an instance where two operators can be next to each other, and it's okay in, in propositional logic. And finally, this horseshoe is just connecting I with A, and that's a correct use of the horseshoe. So this is a perfectly fine, well-formed formula. Sometimes a well-formed formula in logic is called a WUF, W-F-F, and I think that's a very silly name, but uh, maybe you'll get a kick out of that. Um, and the next expression, this is, there are a few things wrong with this one. We see two horseshoes next to each other, that's problematic. Also, again, every time you, you use a two-place operator, if there's more to the statement, you need to separate that off with some parentheses. And here, so we have E and a biconditional and a Q, but no parentheses around that. And we've got Q or an S, but no parentheses around that. So there's something ambiguous here. There should be an extra set of parentheses that aren't here. So for a couple of reasons, this is not a good well-formed formula. In the next example, we've got not X. That's a perfectly fine use of the tilde. It applies to the X. This wedge is connecting this, this negation, not X, with everything to the right. And the, what's on the right is a negation of everything in these brackets. Inside the brackets, we've got a dot that's connecting this parenthetical expression with this parenthetical expression. So that's a correct use of the dot. Inside these parentheses, we've got a biconditional, an E connected to a J, or a, a conditional, not a biconditional, excuse me, uh, connecting the E with the J. Perfectly fine use of the uh, conditional with the uh, parentheses on the outside of it. Same thing over here. So there's nothing wrong with this. That's a perfectly fine, well-formed formula. Next example, the main operator here is this biconditional that connects everything in the brackets to the left with this negation on the right, not K. And I think if we check each one of these, we'll see that everything's fine. This tilde applies to the T, this wedge applies to the negation and this parenthetical expression. Inside the parentheses, we've got a dot and we have two items, one on the left, one on the right of the dot. So that's just fine. And this negation just applies to the K. So everything is fine. And that is a well-formed formula. Uh, same thing in the next example. I think if you check each of these uh, operators, you'll see that everything is following the formation rules of, of these compound expressions okay. This negation, for example, applies to this parenthetical expression. Inside the parentheses, we've got E or M. Uh, this operator has a term on the left and a term on the right surrounded by parentheses, so that's okay. Um, and, the, and on and on we go, basically. Uh, we've got S and Q inside parentheses here. That's a correct use of the dot. This biconditional is connecting this parenthetical expression with E. Notice there's brackets around that entire thing now, and this negation is applying to that bracket. And the, finally, the main operator here is this horseshoe connecting this negation with this negation, and everything is fine. Perfectly fine, well-formed formula. In the next example, we've got a negation 
of this entire expression in curly braces. And if we drill down, we'll see that everything's fine here. I can tell just from looking at it that everything's fine. This negation applies to E, that's just fine. This horseshoe is connecting this negation, not E, with everything inside these square brackets. And that looks just fine. Inside these square brackets, we've got a dot connecting B with this negation of the parentheses. That looks fine. This negation applies to the parentheses. That's fine. Inside the parentheses, we've got A on the left and not I on the right. So that's a perfectly fine use of the wedge. Notice there are parentheses around it like there should be. And this negation here applies to the I and that's a perfectly fine use of negation. So that is a correct use of all the logic symbols and parentheses. So that is a well-formed formula as well. Let's see, in the next example, we've got, um, looks to be fine to me. We've got a main operator here, the dot. The dot is connecting this parenthetical expression on the left with this negation on the right. On the left side, we've got P implies M in parentheses, so that looks okay. The right side is just a negation of, uh, of a conditional, right? We see a tilde here and that applies to these parentheses on the right. Inside the parentheses, we have if B, then not R. That's a perfectly fine expression. So that is a well-formed formula as well. Let's see, uh, in the next expression, we've got a negation of this entire square bracket. That looks okay. And we can just kind of check item by item. Is each one of these operators being used correctly? This negation applies to these parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we've got a conditional with something on the left and something on the right. Again, it's bound by parentheses, so that's good. <clears throat> Again, the main operator is this tilde, but inside the bracket, the main operator of what's inside the bracket is this, um, this uh, uh, triple bar, and that connects this negation on the left with this negation on the right. The negation on the right applies to these parentheses, and inside the parentheses, we just have a conditional if H, then A. So everything looks hunky-dory there, and that is a well-formed formula, correct use of letters and symbols in parentheses. In the next example, though, we have a problem. Inside the bracket, everything looks fine. We've got this uh, triple bar connecting the parentheses on the left with the parentheses on the right, all of that surrounded by brackets. That all looks okay. But where something is going awry here is this tilde. This tilde is supposed to apply, apply to what's immediately to the right of it, and a tilde cannot apply to a dot directly. A tilde has to apply to a statement, uh, either in parentheses or, um, a, as a, or to a single letter. It looks like the person who wrote this, which was me a long time ago, intended this tilde to apply to what was to the left, but that's not how the tilde works. The tilde applies to something immediately to the right of it. So that is not a well-formed formula and not a correct use of the logic symbols. In the next to last example, we have not E, biconditional, and then a parenthetical expression on the right, E or E. And that's a perfectly fine use of symbols. Inside the brackets, we've got a disjunction with parentheses around it. Uh, on the left, we've got a negation, and this um, biconditional applies to what's on the left and what's on the right. Although techni technically, strictly speaking, there should be a square bracket around this entire expression, but it's common to leave those off. So this is a perfectly fine, well-formed formula. In the last example, there need to be some parentheses because this is an ambiguous expression. If you take this dot here, it's not clear what's supposed to be on the right, for example. On the left is, is, is the letter X. On the right, is it just supposed to be the letter P or is it supposed to be all of this in parentheses? That's not clear at all. So uh, again, every time you use one of these two place operators, if it's part of a larger expression, there needs to be some parentheses somewhere to create the natural groupings that go along with that, with that um, operator. So this is not a well-formed formula, not a correct use of the logic symbols. Okay, so I think you can see that it's, it's really important to get some practice um, looking at various uh, patterns and various types of statements using, using these propositional logic operators uh, and, and be able to quickly identify, you know, what's a correct use of those symbols, what's a well-formed formula, and what's an invalid use of the, those symbols. Moving on. <clears throat> so let's look at some negations. So if you remember, a negation is uh, an, an expression like this in English, something like it's not the case or it's false that something or something is not the case, um, something that's not true, for example, and all of those are translated using the tilde. So basically, we just need to figure out which of these uh, expressions in English are, are negations. And I think we can do this really quickly. David Hume was an empiricist, if and only if David Hume thought that knowledge arises from experience. This sentence doesn't say that anything isn't the case, so this is not a negation. 
In the second sentence, science fiction can be used as a setting for political allegories. Again, that's not saying that anything is false or anything is not the case, that anything is not true. So that's not, an, not a negation. Carbon dioxide is CO2. That's not a negation either. It's not saying that anything is false or anything is not the case. The next expression, if time travel is possible, then time travel paradoxes are resolvable. That is an if then statement, but it is not a negation. And finally, in the next example, it is false that green is a primary color. That's a negation, right? The, the sentence that's being negated is green is a primary color. And this sentence here says that it's false that green is a primary color. So that is a negation. Mount Everest is the world's tallest mountain. That is not a negation either. In the next example, it is not the case that the door is wide open. That is a negation. It's a negation of the door being wide open. A second cousin is not an immediate family member. That's a negation as well. You can see the word not here. So it's negating the statement that a second cousin is an immediate family member. It is not true that the Roman Empire was an industrial society. That is a negation, saying that something is not the case, not true. And finally, same thing. It is not true that George Harrison is a living former member of the Beatles. That is a negation of a statement as well. So that would be a negation. On the next part of this page, we need to figure out which of the following statements in propositional logic are a negation. In other words, which ones have a tilde as the main operator? And I think we can blaze through this pretty quickly and uh, figure out the, uh, the right answers. Let's see here. Um, in the first example, uh, it looks like this tilde right here is the main operator because that is applying to everything to the right in square brackets. That's a negation of this expression in brackets and that covers the entire statement. So that would be a negation because the tilde is the main operator. This is a much shorter example uh, in, in the second example. It's a negation of a disjunction. It's not the case that A or Q. So that's a, a negation as well because a tilde is the main operator. Let's see here. Um, you have to be a little careful here in the third example. We do have a negation sticking way out front here, but that only applies to these brackets right here on the left, right? From this, this bracket on the left to this bracket, uh, right bracket that's kind of in the middle of the expression. So this negation isn't the main operator, even though it's hanging out here to the left. It only applies to these square brackets. And same thing with this negation here. This negation only applies to what's inside the brackets. The main operator is actually this wedge. So this is not a negation. This is actually one big either or statement, either everything on the left or everything on the right. And that is not a negation. Uh, let's see, this next example is pretty lengthy. Lots of, lots of tildes here. Um, interestingly enough, you can actually have a negation of a negation, right? And they kind of cancel each other out. You know, if we have not, not M, that's basically the same thing as M. And later in the course, you're going to learn some equivalent rules that show how you uh, simplify some of these expressions to get expressions that are, that are simpler and easier to work with. But let's see if we can figure out what the main operator is here. It looks to me like the main operator is this negation out here on the left. This tilde applies to what's in the brackets. And if you look, this left I'm sorry, the, not the bracket, the curly brace. This negation applies to the curly brace. And you don't get a right-ended curly brace until way out here at the end of the expression. So this negation applies to that very long curly braced expression. And that means that tilt is the main operator. And that is a negation. Uh, same thing here in the, in the next example. We've got a negation that applies to this lengthy expression in brackets. So that would be uh, a negation as well, because the main operator is a, is a negation. In the next example, uh, even though we have a tilde in front, that tilde only applies to these, this parenthetical expression, which doesn't take up very much of the, of the overall statement. So that's not the main operator. And same thing here with this tilde, that tilde only applies to the parentheses on the right. The main operator here is actually this wedge. And that means that this is a disjunction, not a negation. So leave that unchecked. Uh, the next example is interesting. We actually have two negations floating out front um, and they cancel each other out, but it's still a negation, right? This, this first um, uh, tilde is a negation of everything to the right and what's to the right is itself a negation. So even though there are two negations and even though they cancel each other out, the main operator is this tilde way out here on the left because it's negating the negation that immediately follows. So because that's a negation, we're gonna check that box. In the next example, very short example, there's a tilde here, but it only applies to E. The main operator is this dot. That means that that overall statement is a conjunction, an and statement, but it's not a negation. So we're gonna leave it unchecked. 
okay, this is a really lengthy expression and it might take you a minute to kind of visually parse this. Let's just uh, find the negations and see what they apply to. So let's see, we've got a negation here and it applies to this uh, expression in a curly brace, but that curly brace ends in the middle of the expression, leaving all this stuff to the right that doesn't, uh, this isn't governed by that, that tilde. So that can't be the main operator. Turns out, if you kind of drill, it, drill down and look at this, the main operator is this dot right here. That governs everything to the left, the negation of these uh, curly braces, and everything in the square brackets to the right. So because the main operator is not a tilde, this is a conjunction, the dot operator. So that is not a negation. And same thing in this last example. We do have a negation sticking out front, but it only applies to these square brackets the main operator here is actually this wedge. So this is one large either or statement, either all this stuff on the left or all this stuff on the right in parentheses, but the main operator is a wedge, so that is not a negation. So you'll notice an interesting pattern here that all the correct answers have a negation out in front. You just need to make sure that this negation applies to the entire expression that follows and not some smaller piece of that expression. And all the, all the examples where that's the case are, are negations. Okay, moving on. We're gonna do the same pattern with all the rest of these operators. So hang, hang in there with me. This is gonna take a, a little time, but it's good practice to make sure you correctly identify um, you know, which kind of statement you're working with. So next we're gonna look at conjunctions. And like we talked about in the first part of the video, there are a bunch of ways that, that uh, conjunctions are expressed in English. And, but, however, moreover, although nevertheless yet, all those are ways of expressing conjunctions in English and your textbook covers uh, cover these uh, 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 various expressions in English to, to a great degree. Now we need to find statements that are conjunctions in ordinary language. So we're looking for and statements, moreover, but, however, that kind of thing. So the lake is teeming in with life unless the lake is polluted. Now, unless your textbook says to translate as a disjunction. So this is an either or statement. So that is not a, con a conjunction. A curve is exponential if and only if its inverse curve is logarithmic. Now, what's tricky here, there is the word and here, but really this is the expression if and only if. So this is a biconditional, not a conjunction. It's safe to go driving only if the rain has stopped. Only if is a type of conditional, not a conjunction. It does not often snow in the Sierra Nevada mountains in July. This is a negation, it says something is not the case. In the next example, we get our first conjunction here. Rene Descartes was a rationalist, but, meaning it's also the case, David Hume was an empiricist. So both of those statements are true. That is a conjunction. Notice the two simple statements that make it up. Rene Descartes was a rationalist, David Hume was an empiricist. This overall expression says both of those simple statements are true. In the next example, aspirin or ibuprofen can relieve a headache. This is not a conjunction, this is a disjunction. This is an either or statement. Either aspirin can relieve a headache or ibuprofen can relieve a headache. So that is not a conjunction. William Shatner and Chris Pine have portrayed the character of Captain James T. Kirk. Now this is a conjunction. It says William Shatner has portrayed James T. Kirk and Chris Pine has portrayed James T. Kirk. So both of those are, are true, that's a conjunction. Water is essential for life. However, tea is high in antioxidants. However is a type of conjunction in English. It says water is essential for life. However, it's also true that T is high in, in antioxidants. So that is a conjunction. Propositional logic uses statements as its basic units, although syllogistic logic uses terms as its basic units. Now the expression although in English is a, is a type of conjunction. It says, all of this is true. Propositional logic uses statements as its basic units, although it's also true that syllogistic logic uses terms as its basic units. So that is a conjunction as well. And the last example, The Little Mermaid and Alice in Wonderland are Disney movies. This is saying two things are true. The Little Mermaid is a Disney movie and Alice in Wonderland is a Disney movie. So that is a conjunction as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we just need to go through and find which of these expressions in propositional logic are conjunctions. In other words, which have the dot as the main operator. And I'm just gonna blaze through these really quickly. Here we've got a dot as the main operator. It connects everything on the left, which is the negation of this expression in parentheses and not E. So that dot being the main operator is a conjunction. Very simple expression here, A and U, obviously that's a conjunction. 
<coughs> excuse me. The next expression is really, really long, but I think we can start breaking this down. Notice here that we have, if we kind of parse it from left to right, we've got a curly brace here, but that curly brace ends right here in the middle of the expression. Then we have this triple bar. On the right side of the triple bar, we've got another curly brace and that curly brace ends way over here. So this triple bar is actually the main operator because that governs the entire statement. We don't even need to look at everything in the middle. We can see pretty easily that that triple bar is the main expression or main operator. So that is not a conjunction because that's not a dot. Let's see, in the next expression, we've got the negation of everything in these curly braces. Then we've got a dot, and on the right side of the dot, we have a negation of everything in these curly braces. So that dot is the main operator. It governs everything on the left, this negation being connected to this negation. Because that dot is the main operator, that is a conjunction. In the next expression, I think it's pretty easy to see that the dot is the main operator here. The dot is connecting this parenthetical expression with this negation of this parenthetical expression on the right. So that dot is the main operator, and that is a conjunction. There's only one dot in this next expression. It's stuck inside these parentheses and the dot only connects E and Q together, leaving all the rest of this expression untouched. So the dot is not the main operator and that is not a conjunction. In the next expression, we have a couple of dots. This dot here only connects X with not M, just the small expression inside parentheses. So that can't be the main operator. But this dot here connects everything to the left, which is the negation of these square brackets. I think it's pretty easy to see. And it connects, connects that expression to this uh, square brackets on the right. So that dot is the main operator that governs the entire statement. And that is a conjunction. In the next expression, we do have a dot, but that dot is stuck inside these parentheses. And we actually have the negation of that conjunction. So this is not a conjunction. This is actually a negation. The main operator here is this tilde. So this is not a conjunction. In the next example, we do have a dot kind of floating here in the middle. But if you notice, this dot is governing what's inside the, the, these outer curly braces. We've got this square bracket here. We've got this negation of a square bracket here. But all of that is, is surrounded by these curly braces. And there's a negation floating out in front of it. So this negation applies to the entire expression. The main operator is actually that tilde. So because it's not a dot, that's not a uh, conjunction. And let's see, uh, in the last expression, we do have a dot, but that dot is stuck inside these square brackets and doesn't apply to what's out to the, outside to the left. The main operator is actually this horseshoe that governs um, this parenthetical expression on the left and this expression in brackets on the right, but that's not a conjunction because the main operator is not a dot. Okay. We're going to do the same routine on the other operators and then we'll move on and do some truth functions together. So next we have either or statements. And again, there are several ways to translate those in English. There are a few here, um, the expression or, the expression either or, unless can be translated with a, with a, a disjunction with a wedge. Um, and of course you can flip the order of, of, of an either or statement. And uh, same thing here, we have kind of a condensed version. The zebra or the flamingo is pink, it means the zebra is pink or the flamingo is pink. So lots of ways you can express a disjunction in, in English and your textbook goes over some of those. So we need to figure out which of these statements are either or statements. It is false that Tuesday is the first day of the week. Well, I think it's pretty clear that that's a negation, not uh, an either or statement. Barack Obama is the president of the United States only if he is at least 35 years old. So we have only if here, and that's a conditional. This is not an either or statement. In the next expression, it is false that Rome was founded in 537 BC. That would be a, not a disjunction, that's a negation. It's false that something is the case. In the next example, the number eight is even if and only if the number eight is divisible by two. We have this weird expression here in the middle, if and only if, that's a biconditional. So this is not a disjunction. And finally, we get our first disjunction here. Either it rains on Saturday or we will have a picnic on Saturday. That's an either or statement. So that is a disjunction. In the next example, Tiberius and Augustus were Roman emperors. This is not an either or statement, right? This is saying two different things are true. Tiberius was a Roman emperor and Augustus was a Roman emperor. So that's not a disjunction, that's a conjunction. 
the local supermarket has a sale or the local pharmacy does. Now this is a disjunction. It's saying one of two things is the case. Either the local supermarket has a sale or the local pharmacy does. So that is a disjunction. You will pass this course unless you fail this course. So this is an either or statement. It's saying one of these two things has to be the case. Either you'll pass the course or you'll fail the course, even though it uses the word unless. So that can be translated as a disjunction. Although I do want to flag the term unless because a better way to translate unless is with if not, but do it the way your textbook does for the purpose of your homework. Um, but in, out in the real world, you wouldn't translate that with a disjunction. You do it with uh, the phrase if not. Unless the house's front door is closed, the living room is drafty. So again, we have another unless statement here. And as indicated in your textbook, unless is one way of uh, representing a disjunction. So that is a disjunction. And finally, either George Burns or Johnny Carson lived to the age of 100. Turns out it was George, George Burns, if memory serves. Um, but it's an either or statement. Either George Burns lived to be 100 or Johnny Carson lived to be 100. So that is an either or statement. Now I'm gonna do these a little more quickly because these are gonna eat up a lot of time, but basically I'm looking for, what I'm looking for here are expressions in logical notation where a wedge is the main operator and those are gonna be a disjunction. So let's see, I'm just gonna blaze through these and, and, and show you what I'm recognizing when I see them. This one, uh, the first expression, we have a wedge is the main operator, right? The wedge applies to H and it applies to everything in the brackets to the right, covering the entire expression. So that is a disjunction. J or Q, this is very obviously a disjunction, really, really simplest disjunction you can have, right? Uh, in the next expression, we do have uh, some wedges here, but if you look, the main operator is actually this triple bar. This triple bar governs everything to the left in the curly braces and everything to the right in the square brackets, and that covers the entire expression. So that is not a disjunction. That is a biconditional governed by that triple bar. In the next expression, we have a disjunction. The main operator is this wedge and it covers everything to the left in these curly braces. And to the right of that wedge is this negation that covers everything in these curly braces and that covers the entire expression. So that is a disjunction. Let's see, um, in the next expression, the wedge is also the main operator. To the left, we have a negation of what's in the brackets. So the, to, to the left, the main operator is, the, uh, is this negation. On the right, we have a parenthetical expression and the horseshoe in the middle of that is the main operator. But in the overall expression, the main operator is this wedge. It covers this negation and it covers this parenthetical expression on the right. So that's a disjunction. Now here, this one's deceptive. We do have a, 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 dis, a wedge kind of, you know, visually in the middle of the statement, but if you notice, that wedge is stuck inside these, uh, uh, inside these um, square brackets. So that wedge only governs what's on the left and what's on, on the right inside the brackets. The main operator is actually this tilde that governs the entire bracket. So the main operator is a tilde, that means it's not a disjunction. Now, the, it, by contrast, if you look at the next example, visually they look really similar. You've got a, a, tilt, uh, a, a wedge here kind of in the middle and you've got a wedge here kind of in the middle. You have a, a negation out in front, but the difference is that this negation only applies to these square brackets on the left. And on the right, we've got another set of square brackets. Smack in the middle is this wedge and it's not governed by anything else. So that means the wedge is the main operator and that is a disjunction. I think it's really easy visually to see that the dot is the main operator of the next example. We don't need nothing more to say about it than that. Um, so that's not a disjunction. Uh, in the next example, again, as you, as you look at more of these examples, I think you'll see that it's easier, get, it'll get easier and easier and easier to identify the main operator. So you'll go, oh, that dot is stuck inside these parentheses and this wedge governs these parentheses and this square bracket, but that's all governed by these, uh, you know, surrounded by these curly braces. And it's only when you get here that you realize that the horseshoe is the main operator and the horseshoe connects everything on the left inside these braces and this negation to the right. So the horseshoe is the main operator here and that means it's not a disjunction. And in the last example, the main operator is this horseshoe. Even though it's way over here on the left, we have if P, then everything inside the bracket. Now there is a, a wedge inside the bracket, but it's stuck inside these brackets. The main operator that's not stuck in the brackets is, uh, is this horseshoe. So that means it's not a disjunction. 
Anyways, I hope you can see, even though these look a little scary, all you have to do is try to find the main operator. And if it's a, if it's a disjunction, if it's a wedge, then it's a disjunction. If it's a dot, then it's a conjunction. If it's a horseshoe, then it's a conditional statement. Um, I think you'll see the same pattern applies. I, I wanna do a few more just for completion's sake, but we're gonna pick up the pace a little bit here so we can get to the uh, things I want you to spend a little more time on. So we here we have some examples of conditionals and biconditionals. We're given a statement. We are given a key with the, the atomic statements that make up that compound expression mean, and we have to basically translate this expression. So, um, well, it's interesting that some of these examples are already a little outdated, like uh, Sarah Palin's being an Alaskan is sufficient and is sufficient and necessary condition for her being a resident in the largest state in the United States. So we have this phrase here, sufficient and necessary condition. And so this is a biconditional, right? It's something is sufficient and it's necessary. It means it's a conditional that goes both ways. So we're gonna translate this using the triple bar, A triple bar R. Only if lightning strikes, the forest catches fire. Now remember, only if is the necessary condition. And the necessary condition is gonna be the consequent of the conditional. So L is gonna be there on the right side of the horseshoe. So if F, then L. Because only if is a way of specifying the necessary condition and the necessary condition is the consequent of the conditional. The breads being made from whole grain is a sufficient condition for the breads being high in fiber. So again, the sufficient condition now is gonna be the antecedent or the hypothetical part of the conditional, the if part of the if then statement. So the bread being made from whole grain, that's W. So we're gonna have W horseshoe F because the sufficient condition goes on the left and the bread being made from whole grain is the sufficient condition. That's what the example says. Montana is north of Texas if Colorado is north of Texas. Now this isn't only if, this is just a regular old if statement, but the if part is over here on the right. Colorado is north of Texas. And the if part is always on the left of the conditional, left of the, of the horseshoe. So if Colorado is north of Texas, that's C. So if C, then M. Today is July 20th, given that yesterday was July 23rd. So this, um, what's tricky about these conditionals, again, we can express these in either order. So you can't tell from the order that the statements appear in the English sentence, what order they need to be in in the logic notation. You have to pay attention to, you know, which part is the hypothetical uh, part of the conditional. If you have necessary or sufficient conditions, you have to pay attention to which part is the ne necessary condition or the sufficient condition. And if only by paying attention to those things, can you correctly determine which order the two statements need to be in in the, in the conditional. So we could rephrase this, given that yesterday was July 23rd. So if yesterday was July 23rd, then today is July 24th. So let's see, um, Y is yesterday was July 23rd. So if Y, then T. And I just realized I forgot to make this screen a little bigger. I apologize for that. I'm gonna do that right now. There we go. Thomas Jefferson was a human being if and only if he was a member of the species Homo sapiens. So we have if and only if, and whenever you see that, it's a biconditional. If he was a member of the species Homo sapiens and only if he was a member of the species Homo sapiens, that means it's a conditional that goes both ways. That's a biconditional and we're gonna translate that using the triple bar. The universe will collapse into a singularity only if the expansion speed of the universe is less than its escape velocity. So again, we have only if, and only if is a way of specifying a necessary condition. And the necessary condition is always gonna be on the right side of the conditional, the consequent of the conditional. So we have the universe will collapse into a singularity if the universe will collapse into a singularity, which is U then E and E on the right here, the expansion speed of the universe is less than the universe's escape velocity. Don't worry about the language so much. What's important here is that that follows only if, and that's a way of specifying the necessary condition. So that'll be what's on the right side of the conditional right here. If it is raining outside, then the barometric pressure is low. This is just a plain old ordinary if then statement. So this one should be the easiest one of the bunch that we've had so far. If it's raining outside, then the barometric pressure is low. So if R, then B. And there we go. So again, uh, I almost feel like the, I, need, um, I feel the need to apologize for English as a language. English is a quirky, weird, difficult language with a great many uh, redundancies, different ways of saying the same thing. <clears throat> but also 
a lot of ambiguity. Like, you know, statements that sound really similar to each other can have very different logical meanings. You really have to pay attention to what's exactly being said and the, and the, and the structure of the statement involved, the logical structure of the statement involved to be able to translate them correctly. Go through the examples in the textbook, go rewatch this section of the video if you need to, um, do all the homework exercises, make sure you're getting them correct. Definitely look at the answers in the back of the book. You know, the, in, in your textbook, there are some exercises that are starred and there are answers in the back. Check your work and make sure you're getting the correct answers on those and that you're uh, um, identifying these conditionals correctly. Very quickly from here, we're gonna move on past ordinary language and we're just gonna be working in symbols and logic notation all the time. But again, the whole purpose of logic is that it corresponds to English, right? This is a tool that helps you evaluate whether arguments are valid arguments in English. In order to do that, you need to make sure you're getting the correct translation of, of statements that make up an argument in English, translating them into logical notation. So get lots of practice on this this week. Let's keep going. This is kind of a fun exercise. This is, you don't really have to do anything quite like this for your homework, but I think it's, it's, it'll be some good practice to see. Um, again, every time you use a two place operator, if it's part of a larger expression, there need to be some parenthetical marks some parentheses or square brackets or curly braces. So the challenge here is to um, create a, an expression in logical notation that uh, puts the parentheses in the right place. So let's read this first statement. If aspirin relieves aches, then if ibuprofen relieves pains, then burn cream relieves burns. What's interesting here is we have an if then statement, one nested inside the other. If aspirin relieves aches, then what follows is actually another if then statement. So the main operator is gonna be this break right here. If aspirin relieves aches, then we need some parentheses that follow. So we're gonna have something that looks like this. If A, then we're going to have an expression in parentheses. So if ibuprofen relieves pains, which is going to be I, but we're going to need a parenthesis on the left. If I, then B, then burn cream relieves burns. So notice here that the main operator is this first horseshoe, if A, then another if then statement, and then of course the horseshoe that makes up that second if then statement. But the parentheses have to go here. You can't put the parentheses around the A and the I because the main operator in that case would have been this operator. But here the main operator is this first horseshoe. We'll do a couple more of these and then we'll move on. Aspirin relieves aches and either burn cream relieves burns or ibuprofen relieves pains. So the main operator here is actually this and. It says aspirin relieves aches, that's true. And one of the two following things is true. So we're gonna have an A out here, aspirin relieves aches. And what follows is gonna be a disjunction, but we need parentheses around that disjunction because that disjunction is actually part of the conjunction that started at the beginning of the sentence. So either burn cream relieves burn. So we're gonna have a B here with a parenthetical mark around it or ibuprofen relieves pains. And we're gonna have an I here. And this disjunction has to be surrounded in parentheses. Okay, let's do one more of these. In fact, let's do, uh, let's do this one right here. Ibuprofen relieves pains and aspirin relieves aches, or notice the comma placement can, make, can tell you a lot here, or burn cream relieves burns. The main operator is actually this or. It says either two things are true, ibuprofen relieves pains and aspirin relieves aches, all of that, either all of that is true in parentheses or burn cream relieves burns. So the main operator is actually this wedge. So we're in parentheses, we're gonna have, excuse me, parentheses, we're gonna have ibuprofen relieves pains and aspirin relieves aches. Then the main operator, which is a disjunction because this is one long either or statement or burn cream relieves burns. And that's just a B with no parentheses around it. So get some practice on exercises like this. Again, your homework will have lots and lots of exercises like this. Please take the time to do them and let's move on. Okay, so now we're gonna get some practice on these weird uh, statements that are like either or, neither nor, not both, those kinds of statements that we looked at in the per first part of the video, those common phrases that look really similar and sound really similar, but actually have very different logical meanings. So let's look at the first one. Either Kierkegaard was an existentialist or Camus was not. 
Now, this is an either or statement. Either Kierkegaard was an existentialist, so either K or Camus was not an existentialist. And C here means Camus was an existentialist, so either K or not C. Camus was not an existentialist, so K or not C. Notice I'm not even looking at the incorrect answers. I'm kind of just talking through the correct answers. I think if you look at either one, any of these incorrect answers, you can see obviously why, why they're wrong. Like this first example here, you know, not K, that has nothing to do with what you're seeing in the English sentence here. So um, it should be pretty easy to zero in on which of these uh, answers are correct in a, in a case like this. Of course, the ones you're doing, you're gonna have to do from scratch, right? You're gonna have to basically, you know, write your own um, uh, logic sentence from, from English sentences as part of your homework. So penicillin is not an antihistamine drug, but how do you, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Loratadine is. So we have P and L. Penicillin is an antihistamine drug. Loratadine is an antihistamine drug. So penicillin is not an antihistamine drug, but that's a conjunction. Loratadine is. So we have not P and L. Penicillin is not an antihistamine drug. And that's the dot L. Loratadine is an antihistamine drug. That's the correct answer there. Okay, so now we've got a, a, so a couple of English sentences that have more than one possible translation. Remember, in the first part of the video, I showed a couple of English sentences that are equivalent to each other. Let's do a couple of these. Not either Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan is a professional baseball player. So this is a negation of an either or statement, not either. So we know we're going to have a negation of an either or statement, Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan. So definitely that's one of the correct answers. But that means that neither one of them is a professional baseball player. It means Kobe Bryant is not a professional baseball player and Michael Jordan is not a professional baseball player. And that is what this first answer says. K is false and M is false. Kobe Bryant is not a professional baseball player and Michael Jordan is not a professional baseball player. And those two answers are equivalent to each other. Not both Donald Trump and Bill Gates are real estate moguls. So not both, this is the negation of a conjunction. Both is a conjunction, right? Both Donald Trump and Bill Gates, that's a conjunction. This is saying not both, so it's the negation of a conjunction. And that's what we have right here. It's not the case that Donald Trump and Bill Gates are real estate moguls. This negation applies to that entire conjunction. It's not the case that the conjunction is true. But that says that at least one of them is not a real estate mogul, right? Either Donald Trump or Bill Gates is not a real estate mogul. Either D is false or B is false. And these two expressions, the two that I've checked here, are equivalent to each other. Do a couple more of these. Both Texas and Florida are not northern states. So we have T, Texas is a northern state, F, Florida is a northern state. Both Texas and Florida are not northern states. This says Texas is not a, 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 a northern state and Florida is not a northern state. So T is false and F is false. And that's what we have right here. T is false, not T and not F. Not T and not F. But if that's the case, that means it's not the case that either one of them is, right? And that's what's going on in the next answer. It's not the case that either Texas is a northern state or Florida is a northern state. And these two answers are equivalent to each other. And these match up exactly to the examples that are given in your textbook. So it should be pretty easy to see how I'm getting these answers if you've done the reading already. Let's do uh, the last two examples in this page and move on. Either Jackson Pollock or Pierre Auguste, Pierre Auguste Renoir was not a French artist. So we have J, Jackson Pollock was a French artist and P, Pierre Auguste Renoir was a French artist. So either one was not. Either Jackson Pollock was not or Pierre Auguste Renoir was not. And that's what we have right here. Either not J or not P. But if one of them was not, we know that they can't both be, right? And that's what's going on here in answer choice number two. It's not the case that they're both French artists. And those two expressions are equivalent to each other. In fact, there's a whole rule in logic that you're going to learn about in a couple of weeks called De Morgan's rule that lets you translate between these two expressions just like this. Don't worry about that just yet, but I just want you to get why these are, these are equivalent to each other. The, in this last answer choice, it says either J is false or P is false. That means they can't both be true if one of them is false. So it's not the case that J and P are both true. So those are equivalent. 
Last example, neither David Letterman nor Jay Leno is the host of 60 Minutes. So we have D or J. D is David Letterman is the host of 60 Minutes and J is Jay Leno is the host of 60 Minutes. So if neither one is, remember neither nor is a negation of an either or. It's not the case that either or. So that's what we have here. It's not the case that either D or J, that either David Letterman or Jay Leno is the host of 60 Minutes. But that means neither one of them is, right? D is not and J is not. David Lenderman's not the host of 60 Minutes and Jay Leno is not the host of 60 Minutes. And that's what this answer choice right here says. D is false and J is false. And those two answer choices are logically equivalent to each other. So do lots of practice like that on your homework and uh, make sure you can distinguish between these two, uh, these different argument, these different statement patterns, but also tell which, which statements are equivalent to each other based on their, on their logical meaning. The hard thing, of course, is that they sound very similar to each other in English. <clears throat> so let's do a few practice translations, then we're going to jump ahead and do some truth functions and uh, give you the rest of your week back. So these are pretty easy translations. Either Stanford or Yale, oh, actually, let me make this a little bigger before I forget. There we go. Either Stanford or Yale offers a football scholarship. So this is just a straightforward either or statement, either S or Y. So the main operator would be a wedge right there, S or Y. Superman has powers if Batman does. So this is an if-then statement, but notice that the if part is over here on the right, if Batman has superpowers. So that's gonna go on the left side of the conditional because it's the hypothetical term, the antecedent of the conditional. So if Batman has superpowers, then Superman has powers. If B, then S, B, horseshoe S. Verizon expands its coverage area given that AT&T does. So this is just an, a conditional statement. The condition here is AT&T expands its coverage area. So if AT&T expands its coverage area, then Verizon will. So if, if it's if A, then V. Baseball is a professional sport if and only if hockey and tennis are. So here we get a slightly more complex expression. Um, the main operator here is a biconditional. Baseball is a professional sport that's over on one side, if and only if hockey and tennis are both professional sports. So the main operator has to be a biconditional. And there's only one answer choice here with the main operator with a biconditional as a biconditional. So baseball is a professional sport, if and only if two things are the case. Hockey is a professional sport and tennis is a professional sport. And those have to be in parentheses because that's the, that entire expression, that conjunction is the right term of that biconditional. Let's see. Fortune favors the foolish and either love is eternal or life is meaningless. So the first thing you have to do here is figure out what the main operator is. Fortune favors the foolish and, and notice what follows the and is actually an, an either or statement. So the and is the main operator. So we're looking for an answer with a dot as the main operator. And there are two possible choices here. This, this answer choice has a dot as the main operator and this answer choice has a dot as the main operator. Um, on the left side, in the English sentence, on the left side of the dot, we have for, fortune favors the foolish. So F and then the either or statement follows the, the conjunction. And that's what we have here in this answer, answer choice. F dot and then what follows in parentheses is an either or statement. And that matches up with the English statement. Fortune favors the foolish and either E or M, either love is eternal or life is meaningless. Okay, let's move on to some slightly more complicated examples. Okay, we've got an answer key up above or a, a translation key of the various uh, simple statements that make up these compound expressions. Either the glass is not half full or love is not eternal. Notice this is an either or statement. On the left side of the, of the disjunction, we've got something not being the case, the glass is not half full, or something else is not the case, love is not eternal. So what we're looking for is a disjunction, and on either side, we're gonna have a negation. And let's look at these examples. Uh, it's only this last danger choice where we get that. It's not the case that the glass is half full, either the glass is not half full, or love is not eternal, not L. Okay. If avarice is a vice, then either temperance is a virtue or fortune favors the foolish. Notice this is an if then statement. If avarice is a, a vice, then, and then we have a complex expression, an either or statement that follows the then. 
So we're looking for a conditional with an either or statement as the consequent. And that's what we have right here. We've got if avarice is a vice, then, and then what follows the then is an either or statement. Either temperance is a virtue or fortune favors the foolish. Either T or F, T wedge F. If love is eternal and temperance is a virtue, then either fortune favors the foolish or avarice is a vice. I think it's pretty easy to see that this is one fairly lengthy if-then statement. The challenge here is that the antecedent of the conditional is a complex expression. Love is eternal and temperance is a virtue. So if all of that, if love is eternal and temperance is a virtue, then we have an either-or statement following the then. Fortune favors the foolish or avarice is a vice. So before I even look at the answer choices, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for an if-then statement the left side of the, of the statement, the antecedent, needs to be a conjunction because that's what we have here. You know, after the if, we have basically have a conjunction. And then after the then, the consequent of the conditional is an either or statement. So I'm looking for a statement with a, a, a horseshoe as the main operator. On the left will be some parentheses with a dot in the middle. And on the right will be some parentheses with a wedge. And let's see. Looks like this is probably my best answer choice. It's an if-then statement. If love is eternal and temperance is a virtue, that's the expression in parentheses, then we've got a horseshoe, fortune favors the foolish, or avarice is a vice, and that or is represented by the wedge here. Pretty easy to get that answer, I think. Space is the final frontier, provided that the glass is half full, but love is eternal and fortune favors the foolish. You gotta, you gotta be careful not to get tripped up in the language here. So space is the front frontier, provided that the glass is half full. All of that is a conditional before the, before the comma, but then we have another complex expression following the but. Love is eternal and fortune favors the foolish. So notice that the main operator here is actually this but, which is a conjunction. So let's see what we've got. Space is the final frontier, provided that the glass is half full. So this says, if the glass is half full, that's what the expression provided that says. That says this is, the, this is the antecedent of the condition or this is the hypothetical condition. Provided the glass is half full, space is the final frontier. So if G, then S. And love is eternal and fortune favors the foolish. And that's what we have here. Main operator is the dot. That's what this but is. If G, then S. If the glass is half full, then space is the final frontier. But, and then what's following the but is another conditional, or I'm sorry, excuse me, another conjunction. Love is eternal and fortune favors the foolish. Next example. Space is not the final frontier. However, if the glass is half full, then either fortune favors the foolish or love is eternal. So the, the challenge here is to identify the main operator, I think. So let's read this more carefully. Space is not the final frontier. However, if the glass is half full, then either fortune favors the foolish or love is eternal. I think sometimes, uh, you know, as we pronounce these statements in English, sometimes where the natural pause is can often signify where the main operator is. Not always, but I think this is a really good example of where, where, where you, you naturally pause in the sentence helps. Space is not the final frontier. However, and then if you keep reading the rest of it in a single pass, if the glass is half full, then either fortune favors the foolish or love is eternal. That pause tells you where the main operator is, and that means the main operator is gonna be a dot. This, however, it's a conjunction. So what I'm looking for is a dot with not S on the left. Space is not the final frontier. There's only one example like that right here. Space is not the final frontier, not S, and that's however, and if the glass is half full. So now we've got a fairly complex expression in brackets. If the glass is half full, then following the then we have another little complex expression as the consequent of that conditional, F or L. So all of that's inside the brackets. Temperance as being a virtue is a sufficient condition for avarice as not being a vice. So this is a conditional. Whenever you see the, the phrase sufficient condition or necessary condition, you know you're just dealing with a straightforward conditional. Um, temperance as being a virtue is the sufficient condition. So we've got if T, then avarice is not a vice. So if T, then not A. Pretty straightforward there. Sufficient condition is always the left side of the conditional. The right side of the conditional is always the necessary condition. Love's being eternal is a sufficient condition for the glasses being half full. All of that only if 
Fortune favoring the foolish is a necessary condition for spaces being the final frontier. So let's see. So after this phrase, only if we have another conditional, fortune favoring the foolish is a necessary condition for spaces being the final frontier. So let's see, we're looking for a horseshoe as the main operator and another conditional on the right side of that. And inside that conditional on the right, we have to have fortune favoring the foolish being the necessary condition, which we see right here in the last answer choice, right? Because it says that fortune, fortune's favoring the foolish is a necessary condition for spaces being the final frontier, okay? And then the first part of that conditional, loves being eternal is a sufficient condition for the glasses being half full. That's what we have in this answer choice as well. If L, that's sufficient for G, the glass being half full. So that last answer choice is correct. And in the last example, if avarice is being a vice and temperance is being a virtue are sufficient and necessary conditions for loves being eternal, then neither the glass is half full nor space is the final frontier. I think the easier part of this expression is, is following the then, neither the glass is half full nor space is the final frontier. And remember, the um, neither the glass is half full nor space is the final frontier, that's the negation of a of a of a um, either or statement, which we see right here. Right then, neither the glass is half full nor space is the final frontier. The negation of G or S. Let's see if the antecedent matches up. If avarice is being a vice and temperance is being a virtue, so if if A and T are sufficient and necessary conditions for L for love being eternal, that's exactly what we have here in this first answer choice. We have A and T. Sufficient and necessary, that implies a biconditional, and L for loves being eternal, all of that is the antecedent of the overall conditional, and that is the correct answer choice. Okay, so you're going to do lots of practice on some very easy translations and some very hard translations in your homework for the week. I want to spend a little bit of time looking now at truth functions from section 6.2 of your, of your textbook. So let me jump ahead here to... Um, truth functions. This will not take as long as translations. Translations, I almost feel the need to apologize for it. It's always a little tedious. You have to go really, really careful. English is a quirky, weird language. Um, but after this week, we're going to be essentially done with nat natural language, and we're going to be working in, in logic symbols entirely from this point on, with the exception of one um, revisit to, uh, to natural language when we get to predicate logic um, later in chapter eight, several weeks from now. So let's dive in and look at section 6.2 from your textbook on truth functions. This will not take anywhere near as long as it took to go through the translations. So remember the definitions of the logical operators that, we, uh, that I covered in the first part of the video. For a negation, there are only two possible combinations. For any given statement P, there are two possible truth values. P is either true or P is false. The negation of that will always have the opposite true val truth value. If P is true, not P is going to be false. And if P is false, not P is going to be true. That's the definition of a negation. I think that's pretty, pretty intuitive. For a biconditional, remember the other name for a biconditional is material equivalence. And that name is really helpful. If the two terms involved are equivalent, you know, if they're both true or they're both false, then you have a true biconditional or a true equivalence. If they have different truth values, then the biconditional will have a, a false truth value. And there are four possible combinations. This is a two-place operator. We have P and Q. Uh, there are four possible combinations. Either P and Q are both true, or P is true and Q is false, or vice versa. P is false and Q is true, or P and Q are both false. And those are the four rows we see in the truth table here. So let's do these one at a time. So we're looking for uh, whether or not these truth values are equivalent. And if P and Q are equivalent, if they're both true, that biconditional will be true. If they have different truth values, like you see here in the second row, the biconditional will be false. And same thing in the next row. P is false and Q is true. They're not equivalent, so the biconditional is false. But in the last row, P and Q are both false. That means they are equivalent, so that biconditional will be true. For conjunctions, remember conjunctions correspond to the English term and. So we're looking for a case where P and Q are both true. And that's gonna be the only case where a conjunction is true. If P is true and Q is true, you end up with a true statement. 
if not, if it's not the case that P and Q are both true, you end up with a false statement. And in all the other rows, it's not the case that P and Q are both true, so you get false in all the other rows. So again, for a conjunction, it's only when P and Q are both true together that you end up with a true statement. For a disjunction, remember a disjunction means that at least one of the two statements is true, or both. It's an inclusive or that includes the possibility that P and Q are both true together. So the question you wanna ask here for a disjunction is, is it the case that at least one of these two terms is true? And in the first row, yes, it is the case that at least one of the two terms is true, so you end up with a true disjunction. Same thing in the next row. At least one of the two terms is true and happens to be P, you end up with a true disjunction. Same thing in the next row. At least one of the two is true, so you end up with a true statement. But in the last row, it's not the case that you end up with at least one of the, true, one of the two statements being true, so you end up with a false disjunction. So the only, it's, only time you end up with a false disjunction is when both terms are false. If either of the two terms or both are true, you end up with a true disjunction. The one that's really weird here and that you might just have to remember, hopefully you can make this intuitive for yourself, you, you know, with the examples that I gave in the first part of the video, but you might just have to memorize this. For a conditional, there's only one case when you end up with a false conditional. That's when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. In all the other rows, you end up with a true conditional. Like so. And those are the definitions of the five propositional logic operators. And these are the only five propositional logic operators. We're basically going to be dealing with these five operators for the next several weeks. So it's really, really, really important that you commit these truth tables to memory. Even better if you can make them intuitive for yourself. Okay, moving on. So now we want to get some practice identifying the main operators of statements. <clears throat> We got a little practice of this in the in the first part of the video, but uh, it's so important. Um, you won't be able to do the truth tables that you have to do uh, next week. You won't be able to do the logic proofs that you have to do several weeks from now. You have to make this so, so easy and intuitive for yourself. Make sure you get lots of practice on this in particular. So remember, the main operator is a statement that governs the largest statement components, um, leaving no portion of the statement unexhausted. So the statement with the largest scope, in other words. So here, if you go operator by operator, you'll see that this horseshoe has the, has the largest scope. On the left side of the horseshoe is just E, and the right side is everything else, this negation of these parentheses, and every other operator has a smaller scope. This negation, for example, right here just applies to M. This wedge just covers the things that are inside the parentheses. This negation just applies to the parentheses to the right of it. It doesn't cover this E out here on the left. It's only this horseshoe that governs the, governs the entire statement. So that's the main operator. And we should be able to blaze through, through these pretty, pretty easily. This wedge can't be the main operator because it only applies inside the parentheses. This negation only applies to the E. But this horseshoe, however, applies to the entire statement. On the left is this parenthetical expression. On the right is this negation. And that negation applies to that entire parenthesis on the right. So this horseshoe, governs the entire statement. This is a conditional. If this parenthetical expression, then this negation on the right. This one's a little trickier because uh, it's all dots and it's all P's. So visually, this one's gonna be a little trickier. It can't be this dot because this dot only applies to what's inside these parentheses. Same thing here. It can't be this dot that I'm circling because that only applies to what's inside these parentheses. This dot connects this parenthetical expression on the left and this parenthetical expression on the right, but all of that is governed by these brackets and that dot doesn't apply to anything outside those brackets. So that can't be the main operator. This dot here connects P on the right and this lar large bracketed expression on the left, but all of that is bound up by these braces. So again, that doesn't cover the entire expression, so that can't be the main operator either. The last operator here is just, it's just a single uh, uh, dot that governs that expression inside parentheses, it just governs P and P. And that leaves the rest of the statement un unexhausted. So it's only this dot here that covers the entire expression. This dot here, the second from the right, covers this entire expression on the left in braces and this parenthetical expression on the right, and that's the entire expression. So that dot is the main operator. <clears throat> in the next example, Let's see what we've got. Um, 
actually, right off the bat, this should be pretty easy to figure out. We've got a tilde out here on the left, and that tilde applies to this bracket immediately next to it. And that bracket doesn't end all the way until the end of the expression. So this negation applies to this entire bracket of the expression to the right. And that means it is the main operator. And that is the answer. And the last example here is a little tricky. You got to be really uh, pay attention to where these brackets begin and end. So on the left, we got a bracket, but we also have that a bracket that ends that bracket right here in the middle of the statement. We have a wedge, and then to the right of the wedge, we've got another bracketed expression right here. So we've got two bracketed expressions connected by a wedge. That means that wedge is the main operator, and uh, that is the answer. So get lots of practice identifying the main operators. It might be tricky when you first start. You really might have to go operator by operator and go, okay, what does this operator apply to? And you know, is that stuck inside some uh, parenthetical expression or is that just a portion of the statement? As you do this more and more and more, you're gonna be able to look at them very quickly and visually and be able to identify the main operator qu very quickly. It might seem daunting now, but once you get a little practice, this is gonna be second nature to you. Okay, moving on. Okay, I wanna do some truth functions with you guys now. So remember the, the whole idea behind propositional logic is that for a compound statement, the truth value of that statement is made up or determined by the truth value of the simple statements that make up that compound expression. So here we're given a fairly lengthy compound expression. It's got um, statements Z, Z, R, and F, and B, and P, and we're given a key. Z is true, R is false, F is true, B is false, P is true. Uh, interestingly enough, this is a little Easter egg. This is stuff I wrote years ago, ZRF are my initials. So this is my little Easter egg inside what you're seeing here. Um, what we wanna do, we wanna plug in these truth values beneath these um, uh, simple statements. And then we're operator by operator, we're gonna start inside the innermost operators that are stuck inside those parentheses and work our way out until we get to the main operator, calculating the value for that operator at every turn, according to the rules for that operator. So step one is just gonna be plugging in the truth values. So we're gonna plug in T underneath Z because Z is true, tells us that R is false, tells us that F is true, tells us that B is false, and it tells us that P is true. So now we can figure out the truth values of those um, uh, operators that are stuck inside the parentheses. So for example, here we've got Z and R inside parentheses, and it tells us that Z is true and R is true. So we've got a true statement and a false statement. That means that that dot has to be false because it's not the case that both of those operators are true. Remember, a dot is only true if both of the two things that are being conjoined are true. Over here to the right, Inside these parentheses, we've got a conditional, if F then P, and we've got F is true and B is false. So if true, then false. <clears throat> and actually here, we're just gonna carry these down. We're actually gonna do one, one step at a time. I see it's only asking us to do one, one step at a time. So we're kind of repeating our answers there. So we're gonna carry this down. F is still, that conjunction is still uh, false. But over here though, we're gonna try to find the answer for this horseshoe, if T then F. And remember, for a conditional, there's only one case when a conditional is false. That's when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. That's one of those things you might just have to remember about conditionals. So that is going to be false. And here we're just going to carry our answer down for P. <clears throat> now, though, let's see, we're continuing our answer. This was just asking us to repeat our answer. Um, We've got the negation of something false. Notice that this negation here applies to everything inside the bracket, but we know that entire bracket is false or the parentheses are false. So the negation of something false is something true. And here we're just carrying our answers down. So now after we've simplified this a bit, we can see that inside this bracket, we've got a false expression or a true expression. And so inside that bracket is a disjunction. And remember, a disjunction is true if either of the two disjuncts are true. It's an either or statement. So here we end up with a true disjunct. Here we're just carrying our answer down from above. And we've got true is equivalent to, the main operator here is this triple bar, something true. This entire expression in brackets is true, in other words, given those truth values that were, that were given at the beginning. So something true is equivalent to something true. They have identical truth values. That's what a triple bar means. It's a equivalence or a biconditional. 
So that overall expression will be true. And we just figured out now that from these simple expressions, this entire complex expression is true ba based on those truth values. But you can see what we did. We started by working on the innermost operators, calculating the value for each of the subsequent operators, working our way out until we get to the main operator. Now, when you first start doing this, it might be helpful to do it on multiple lines like this, but very quickly, you wanna kind of move beyond that and um, be able to do this on a single line. It'll go a lot, a lot faster for yourself, but it takes a little practice to be able to do that. Let's do one. So here we've got a given proposition, it's fairly lengthy. Um, let's take a quick look at it. After, let me blow it up, make it a little easier for you guys on the, on the screen, there we go. So we've got a fairly lengthy expression. Real quick, I want to identify the main operator. The main operator is this horseshoe because that connects everything in the bracket on the left and this expression Z is equivalent to F on the right. Um, we're given some truth values. So the first thing we want to do is plug in these truth values right below the statement. If you're doing this on paper, you just write it down. I'm, I'm typing it here to make it easier for you guys rather than showing you my chicken scratch writing. I'm, I, found a way to make this easier for you to, to see on the screen, given this is a, an online class. But we're going to plug in our truth values. We know I is false. That's given to us. We know R is true. That's given oops, is true. That's given to us. We know C is false. We know Z is true. And we know F is true. And now we want to start on the inside and work our way out. And we have a couple places we could start. We could start here inside this parent parenthetical expression, or we could start over here inside this parenthetical expression. I'm going to start way over here on the right. Inside the parentheses, it says Z is equivalent to F, Z triple bar F. And remember, uh, two statements are equivalent if they have the same truth value. And Z and F here do have the same truth value. They're both true. That means that biconditional, that triple bar has to be true. Let's go do the other one, uh, the other uh, parenthetical expression that could have been a good starting point. We've got R or C, and remember this is a disjunction. So if either of the two expressions, R or C are true, we end up with a true disjunction. So we have that here, R is true. So we end up with a true disjunction. One of the two is true. Working our way out, notice that this negation applies to this parenthetical expression, but that parenthetical expression is true. We just found that out. That's the value below that disjunction inside the parentheses. So if that disjunction is true, the negation of it has to be false. And we just found out the value for that negation. Continuing to work our way out, notice we're still inside the brackets here on the left. We've got I and a negation. So the two things that are being connected by this dot are I and this value underneath the negation. And it's a conjunction. So a conjunction is only true if both of the two terms are true. We've got something false being connected to something false. That means we're gonna end up with a false conjunction. It's not the case that both of those two values are true. This is where you have to be a little careful. You have to make sure that you're drawing from the two correct values for evaluating the final, uh, final operator. So this horseshoe connects everything in this bracket to everything in this parenthesis on the right. Just inside the bracket now, the main operator of what's inside the bracket is gonna be this dot. So we're gonna connect the value of this dot to the value of this uh, biconditional inside the parentheses. And so we've got something false implying something true. There's only one case when uh, a conditional is false. That's when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And that's not what we have here. So we know that this conditional has to be true. And of course, uh, I didn't indicate right off the bat, but that's the main operator as well. Anyways, that's how you do truth functions on a single line. Um, let's skip ahead a little bit more. Let's do a couple, couple more examples of this and then um, we'll end this video. Okay, so we're given some truth values. Z, R, and F are true and B, T, and P are false. So let's plug in those values. We'll, we'll do a few of these uh, examples and work our way up to, to more complex examples. So B is false and P is false. That's part of the given information. This is very simple. There's only one operator, so that's the main operator. We have something false and something false. It's not the case that both of those are true. So this is a false conjunction and that statement is false. Okay, same thing. Let's plug in our truth values. Over here, we know T is false and we know B is false. 
Um, the main operator is this dot, but we can't figure that out yet because the dot isn't connecting B, the dot is connected to this negation. So the very first thing we have to do is figure out the value of this negation. So if B is false, the negation of B has to be true. So now the two columns that are being connected by this, um, by this dot are T and this negation. So we have something false and something true. It's not the case that both of them are true. This is a conjunction. So that conjunction is going to be false and this overall statement is false. Okay, let's see, we've got uh, P is false, that's given, T is false. Same situation here, the main operator is a wedge, but that wedge isn't connecting to this T, it's connecting to this negation. So we need to figure out the value of that negation before we can figure out the value for the main operator. So if, if, if uh, the statement T is false, we know the negation of T has to be true. Now this wedge is connecting P with this negation, so something false or something true. At least one of the two is true. This is a disjunction. And whenever you have at least one of the two disjuncts being true, you end up with a true disjunction. So this statement is true. Okay, over here, you have to be really careful to identify the right main operator. This negation only applies to P. It's this wedge that's the main operator. The wedge is connecting not P, and it's connecting B. So let's mark that as the main operator right off the bat. Let's plug in our truth values. Both P and B are false. That's part of the given information. So we can't figure out the value for the main oper operator yet until we figure out the value of this negation out on the left. So if P is false, not P has to be true. Now this is where you have to be really, really careful. So I'm gonna go really slowly here and make sure that this is clear. This disjunction is not connected to P. This disjunction is connected to not P. It's saying either not P, all of this, or B. So the two values that you care about here for determining the value of this, this disjunction are this negation right here that I've highlighted and the value under B that I've highlighted. So here you've got something true, and I'm gonna highlight it just to make it really clear. Either this value or B, at least one of them is true. This negation is true. So that disjunction is true, and this statement is true. Okay, let's do a few more of these. Let's see, uh, it tells us that Z is true, it tells us that F is true. The main operator is this horseshoe, if F, then not Z. But we need to figure out the value for not Z. If Z is true, then not Z is false. Now we've got something true, F implying this negation, which is false. So something true implying something false. That's the one case when a conditional is false. So this statement is false. Okay. P is false. T is false. That's part of the given information from above. Same situation. We need to figure out the value of this negation before we can do anything else. So if T is false, that negation would have to be true. So now we've got if P then not T, the two values we care about are this value and this value into the negation. And uh, we have something false implying something true, and that would be true according to the definition of a, of a conditional. So this statement is true. Oop, I didn't mark the main operator, there we go. Now let's see, we know that Z is true. We know that R is true, that's given information. Again, to be really, really clear here, you have to be careful which values you care about. This conditional is governing not Z and it's governing R. This negation only applies to Z. So the two things that are being connected by this horseshoe are not Z, it's the negation of Z way out here and R. So the two columns we're gonna care about are this space right here that I've highlighted and R. So if Z is true, not Z is gonna be false. So now we have something false right here, implying something true. And according to the definition of a conditional, that is true. And this statement is true. One more of these simple examples, and then we'll do a couple complex examples. Z is true. T is false. That's part of the given information. So the main operator is this, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mark the main operator here. That horseshoe is the main operator. Back over here, the biconditional is the main operator. I think that's pretty clear. It says Z is equivalent to not T, but we don't know not T yet. We just know T. 
we know t is false. So the negation of that t has to be true. Now we've got t by conditional t, something true, by conditional, something true. They are equivalent. So that by conditional is true. And this overall statement is true. Okay. So again, you want to start with the, the, the operators with the smallest scope. And I think you can see here that this negation has a smaller scope than the biconditional because that negation only applies to the T, whereas this biconditional governs the rest of the statement. So you want to start by calculating the values of the smallest scope first and work your way to the main, the main operator. Okay, slightly more complex examples. <clears throat> <clears throat> the given truth values, it tells us that dx and a are true and sop are false. So let's start by plugging in those values in this first example. So we've got p is false. We've got o is false. Let's figure out the main operator first. Um, the main operator can't be this tilde because that only applies to o. It can't be this wedge because that wedge is stuck inside these parentheses. So the main operator has to be this negation out here on the left that negates everything that follows. So that's the main operator. And now you have to be careful here because it's a question of what it's a negation of. It's a negation of the parentheses, but the main operator inside the parentheses is this wedge, right? Inside the parentheses, you've got P or not O. So it's a negation of whatever we end up with here, uh, whatever we end up with under the, under the wedge. But the statement with the smallest scope or the, the operator with the smallest scope is actually this negation. Uh, if O is false, that means that negation has to be true. Still inside the parentheses, we now have P or not O. We've got P is false and the negation of O is true right here. So false or true, at least one of those two is true. So that wedge is true. And again, just to be really, really, really clear here. This is a negation, not of every individual item inside the parentheses, but of the main operator inside those parentheses. So this is the negation of that wedge. And if that wedge is true, the negation has to be false. And this statement is false. <clears throat> okay, let's do a couple more of these complex examples and I will give you your week back. So dx and a are true and S, O, and P are false. So we've got S is false, O is false, and P is false. Let's start by identifying the main operator. Um, the main operator is not this negation because that just applies to S. It's not this biconditional because that's stuck inside the parentheses. The main operator is actually this dot. But I want you to pay attention, even before we get started, I want you to pay attention here to what that dot is connecting. That dot is connecting this negation not S. So the value that we're going to care about on the left is whatever is going to be under this tilde. And on the right, it's the negation of that entire expression in parentheses. And that's going to be governed by this biconditional, which is the in just in the parentheses now the main operator inside the parentheses. So let's work our way uh, outward, uh, trying to figure out the value for that, that dot. But whenever you've got a, a case like this, where you have something complex on the left of an operator and something complex on the right of the operator, what you have to do is find the values for the main operators inside each of those two components that are governed by the main operator. So let's start with the easy things. Um, if S is false, we know not S has to be true. And uh, here inside the parentheses, we have O by conditional P. They are equivalent. They're both false, but they're equivalent. So that by conditional is true. And now we can figure out the value for the main operator. And again, the main operator governs this negation. So we care about this value here that I've highlighted under the tilde, and we care about this value underneath the main operator inside the parentheses, and that's gonna be the biconditional. So we've got something true and something true, and both conjuncts are true. So we end up with a true statement, and we know this statement is true. There we go. Let's, go, let's skip ahead of it and do this last example. So we know that dx and a are true, s, o, and p are false. Let's figure out what the main operator is first. Um, there's a negation out here on the left, but this is the negation just of these parentheses. So that can't be the main operator. Uh, the main operator can't be anything inside these parentheses on the right. So the main operator has got to be this wedge. But again, before we get started, I want you to pay attention to what that wedge is actually connecting. On the left is actually a negation. So 
um, it's a negation of everything in the parentheses. So this wedge connects this negation right here, way out here on the left, with the main operator inside these parentheses on the right, which is that dot. So let's get started. The statements with the smallest scopes are these negations in the parentheses. So if D is true, not D would be false. And over here on the right, if S is false, not S would be true. And from here, you can kind of pick which direction one you, you want to go. You can find the value of this dot on the left. You can find the value of this dot on the right. I'm going to start on the right completely arbitrarily. This dot connects not S and P. So we care about the value under the negation and we care about the value under P. So we have true and false, which is false. It's not the case that both of those two columns are true. Over to the parentheses on the left, this dot connects O and it connects the negation of D. So we care about the value under O and we care about the value under this tilde. So we've got false or false. It's not the case that they're both true. So we end up with a false conjunction. Now you gotta be careful because you can't do the main operator yet because this main operator, this wedge doesn't govern the parentheses, it governs the negation of the parentheses and we don't know that yet. So um, inside the parentheses, the main operator just inside those parentheses on the left is that conjunction, which is false. And the negation of that would be true. So now we can do the main operator. We've got something true way out here on the left, this negation, or the main operator inside these parentheses, the dot. So I'm gonna highlight these just to make it really easy to see. Something true or something false. And at least one of the two is true. We, one of those is true. So the disjunction is true. That's the main operator and the statement is true. Okay, let's continue to do <clears throat> a couple examples. These examples are gonna get increasingly more complex, but I wanna do a really hard one now that I've done plenty of easy ones. So you can see that it's not any, it's not any harder. It's just a matter of, making sure that at every turn for every operator, you know exactly which two um, uh, components to look to. Uh, if, you look, if you look to the wrong columns, obviously you're gonna get the wrong values and you're gonna get the answer incorrect. So uh, same thing here, we've got K, L and M are true, Q, R and S are false. So I'm gonna go down to the last example here. K, L, L and M are true, let's plug that in. M is true, L is true, L is true and Q, R, and S are false. So I'll plug those in, boom, boom, and boom. There we go. Before we get started, the first thing I would almost always do is try to find the main operator. And uh, it's tricky here because this is a fairly lengthy uh, expression. I can do it, you know, at the blink of an eye because I've been doing this for years, but for you, you might have to slow down and uh, really, really dissect this. Let's just kind of go operator by operator. Um, this biconditional here, this triple bar, can't be the main operator because that's stuck inside these parentheses. Um, going to the other side, this negation here just applies to S, so that can't be the main operator. This dot is stuck inside these parentheses. This negation here, this tilde, only applies to the parentheses to the right of it, so that can't be the main operator. This wedge connects the parenthetical expression on the left and this negation on the right, but all that's still inside these brackets, so that can't be the main operator. The only candidate for a main operator is this biconditional right here. That connects this parenthetical expression on the left with everything in this bracket on the right. So that's the main operator. And that cover, covers or exhausts or governs the entire statement. So we can pick our starting place here. I'm gonna start on the left. Um, inside these parentheses, we have M is equivalent to L. They are equivalent, they're both true. So that biconditional will be true. And again, you want to start with the statement, the operators that have the smallest scope. So here, um, I'm going to start with these negations that are right next to the atomic statements. If S is false, we know this not S has to be true. And same thing over here. If Q is false, we know that not Q has to be true. I'm going to continue on the right side. Um, this dot governs L and not S. So the two columns that I care about here are under L and under this tilde. So we have something true and something true. That means that dot will have to be true. Notice though that we have a negation. This whole parenthetical expression is being negated by this tilde. 
But that tilde negates the value of the main operator inside those parentheses. And inside the parentheses, just right here, again, just to be really clear, not the main operator of the overall statement, but just inside these parentheses, the main operator is that dot. So this negation negates that dot. So if that dot is true, this negation is false. Inside these parentheses in the middle of the expression, we've got something false, R, implying the negation of Q, and the negation is the value under that tilde. So false implying true, and according to the definition of the horseshoe, that is true. We're still inside the brackets now. We can't do the main operator yet because we haven't finished inside these brackets on the right. So here you have to be really careful. The main operator inside the brackets, not the main the overall expression, but just inside the brackets now is this wedge. And the wedge is connecting this parenthetical expression on the left with this negation of the parenthetical expression on the right. So we care about this value under the horseshoe, which is the main operator inside those parentheses, and we care about the value of this tilde right here. I'm just gonna go really slow. We've got something false or something false it's not the case that either, oh, I'm sorry, I meant true. <laughs> I said false, I meant true. So it, just to clarify, inside these uh, par uh, parenthetical expression on the left, the main operator inside these parentheses is this uh, conditional. So you have something true or something false. Show it again here, something true or something false. At least one of them is true. So we end up with true underneath that wedge. Now we can do the main operator. The main operator is this biconditional right here that I've indicated with the X. On the left of that biconditional is this parenthetical expression and the value we care about there is the main operator inside those parentheses, which is that value that I've highlighted there, true. Over here on the right, this biconditional is governing everything on the right, everything inside the bracket. Inside the bracket, the main operator is that wedge that we just found. So now to go really slowly, we've got something true being equivalent to something true. They are equivalent, so the main operator is true, and this compound statement is true. And this is about the highest level of complexity you're gonna get even from your, your textbook exercises. Um, that's about all I have for you. Uh, so again, just to recap, make sure you uh, memorize the definitions of those, those logical operators. They're, they're truth values that define, um, you know, the, the, the resulting truth value from the combinations of simple truth values that make them up. Get lots of practice translating English statements, comp complex compound English statements into logical notation. Pay extra special attention to conditionals and biconditionals. A lot of the trouble translating English uh, statements into logic has to do with conditionals. Um, getting lots of practice identifying the main operator of compound statements. Everything we're going to do for weeks on end now is going to depend on your ability to do that and get practice evaluating the truth values uh, underneath the main operator of a compound expression. To do that, you start with the uh, operators that have the smallest scope, calculating the value at every turn, working your way outward until you get to the main operator. Just be careful that at every step, you're making sure you're pulling from the correct values, making sure you're paying attention to what two things are being connected by each operator. Otherwise, you're going to get incorrect values. The textbook gives you lots of examples to read about, lots of examples to practice on. Make sure you get me your uh, week two homework assignment by the end of Sunday uh, at 11.59 p.m. Sunday night. Um, let me know if you have any questions or concerns. I'm very easy to get a hold of by email. Um, you can get a hold of me through Blackboard. Um, you know, definitely if, you're, if you find anything confusing or if you find you're not able to do any of the exercises, definitely let me know because this class will really snowball. Everything we're going to do next week builds on your ability to do the things you've done in week two. Logic is a highly cumulative class. And if you get behind at these early stages, you really won't be able to get caught up in time to be successful later in the class. So please, please, please do all of your homework. Make sure you're keeping on top of everything. Make sure you can get the correct answers. Check your, your answers with the answers that are in the back of the book. Contact me if you have any questions or concerns. We can always jump on Zoom or jump on a phone call. I can talk you through any of the exercises. I want you to be successful in the class, but you have to get practice on these things in order to be successful. If you don't master the things we do this week, you won't be able to do the activities that we do next week. That's all I have for you. Hope you guys have a great week too. Again, just make sure you get me your homework assignment by Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Other than that, have a great week and I'll look to hear from you if you have any questions or concerns. Thanks a lot.